Hi, everyone. Welcome to Office Hours. Uh, if you have questions for us, so we answer your questions about media production every single day, seven days a week. And if you have those questions, you can, go, of course, throw them into Makana. You can vote on those questions. You can chat about them. Uh, and you can find those in the email. And you can get to the email by signing up for it on the website, officehours.global. Uh, if you're not uh, in Makana, you can actually ask questions 24-7 uh, without any kind of sign up or anything else. Uh, you can just go to askofficehours.global. That's askofficehours.global. Uh, you can just go up there, ask your question, and we will feed them in um, and, uh, and answer them as fast as we can. Let's go ahead and jump into those questions. Bill, what do we have? First one comes from David Brady in New York City, and David says, our workflow for bringing presentations into an event has been via single stream USB capture, Magewell or an NRG and so forth. Could an Ultra Studio Mini or 4K be used in a similar fashion, and what would be the advantage of doing so? Guy? Yeah, it depends on what the content is and uh, which Ultra Studio it is. Uh, some of the old, older Ultra Studios that have the Thunderbolt 2 connections, you want to be very weary of those. Uh, if you're already using a major one it's working, my question would be why switch unless it's something that you have laying around. Uh, the ability to import a, a 4K, you know, full 3840 by 2160 image size may be one of the reasons why you need to step up above a, a major well, depending on which one that is. But I like using stuff that works, and I like using the same thing across the board. Once I go to go to trust a brand in a specific item, I, I tend to stick with that brand and item as I go across the line. So I don't I don't like switching things up because you might get surprised, unless I have it for a backup, of course. Next question. Next one comes from Robert Soji in Los Angeles, and Robert wonders what reasons would you need to purchase an M3 Max over an M3 Pro? Good, Bill. So um, what I've run into is in doing video work, there have been a few things that I've used that requires a higher level chip. Now, the Max and Pro are both at kind of the higher end of things. So in that particular case, um, I, I, I try to stay away from the base level machines just because I have to do this for a living. And particularly the video processing capability is important to me. I will say, though, that often at the two high-end options, I go for the lesser of the two because in most cases, there's nothing processor-wise going to slow me up very much. It may mean that uh, a particularly hard render will take 10 minutes versus 5 minutes. Well, that's not critical to most of the kind of work I do. Now, if I was in a show kind of circumstance and I was fighting deadlines, that extra boost would be very important. And if I had a really long, complex render, it might be the difference between a two-hour versus a one-hour render. But most of the time, for me, the sweet spot is one level back from the most performance I can get. That's just how I think about it. Well, that would, the one back from the most performance would be Ultra, wouldn't it? I mean, wouldn't, that's the... I think oh, that's Ultra the, and Max. That's what I was thinking yeah, of. You're right. This is in Pro versus Max. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Grant. Yeah, when I, uh, when I was replacing my uh, MacBook, I had a MacBook 16, so it would have been a 2019. Uh, I normally would spend about six grand Australian, right? And so, uh, so I was thinking about how I would replace that with the M series. And what I decided to do was instead of buying a maxed out uh, uh, laptop, I ended up getting a studio and a MacBook Air. And for the same sort of money. So I spent $4,000 on a studio and uh, $2,000 on a MacBook Air. And I decided to just get the Max. So it was an extra $2,000 to go to the Ultra. Um, and so I ended up with a MacBook Air instead. Uh, that's uh, two years, nearly three years ago. Um, and I've, I've been really happy with that. So the $2,000 more for the Ultra was not worth it for me. Although... One thing that I that I do note and is worth noting is that the the Thunderbolt um, extra capacity in the Ultra. So, in in the studio, what that would mean is that the um, the ports on the front of the studio uh, were all are all Thunderbolt ports, whereas in the Max version, they're USB C ports. Um, and so there's just a there's a little bit less bandwidth as far as the Thunderbolt goes. And so that's worth just double checking that. Um, it's not just about processing time or, or um, you know, processing capacity, obviously that it has two Max chips in it, um, but it's worth checking that and looking at that on the, uh, on the MacBooks as well. So. And if we look at just the, like a MacBook Pro 14 inch, just to kind of as reference uh, for this, just to give you a sense of the differences here, so this is from Apple's site here. 
and uh, we can go and zoom in a little bit more here. Um, so here's your, you know, here's your 12, up to 12 cores, um, up to 18 cores, and here you have up to 16, up to 40. Um, one thing that's really important, um, I think, is, is the neural engine's the same, um, same as the ray tracing. Uh, one of the things that I think is important um, as you as you look at this is that there's 150 gigs of memory bandwidth and 400 gig, gig, gigabytes per uh, memory bandwidth for the Max chip, and that's going to make a difference as it as you as it comes into um, as you're trying to process um, a lot of things that, that take a lot of textures. So 3D, um, you know, obviously anything with 3D elements in it, but also video. So so if you're really doing a lot of rendering. Uh, you may find that the Max chip is going to be uh, more important to you. Uh, the Pro chip is probably going to be fine for most things that you kind of were on the edge between the between the Air and the Pro. Um, and in the MacBook Pro, the, the Pro is going to be a little bit faster. It's going to be incrementally better than the Air. Uh, but you're not really seriously doing tons and tons of video, you know, video on the, you might have to do a little bit here and there, but you're not, it's not your main driver as a video producer or as doing 3D um, if it's your main driver, you're probably going to want to move to the to the to the max um, for that memory bandwidth. Um, if it's your main driver for video, you probably want to move to the max. Um, but if you're if it's occasional, um, you need a little bit more than what the Air has. You needed the extra two ports. Uh, you need a little bit more speed. Um, I think that the the Pro is probably fine. But if you're really going to be pushing a lot of Pro K, you know, 4K video, um, you know, 3D rendering, that type of thing, lots of compression, you're probably going to want to get go ahead and go one step up. Um, next question. Next one comes to us from Talalak Lopez Waterman in Wilmington, Delaware. What's your favorite unmanaged switch that can also provide power over Ethernet plus plus? The PoE plus plus seems to narrow the field quite a bit. Go ahead, guy. Yeah, I'd love to hear more about what Talalak's doing with a. If it's just to power some uh, cameras, some PTZ cameras, because uh, I've seen some of the stuff that he's uh, working on right now. And uh, if it's just to power cameras, you, there's some inexpensive Netgear models. But if you do need to actually send NDI or Dante or anything, any kind of data that's AV related, I would definitely spend the extra money and get a 4250 with the PO plus, PoE++ plus plus on it. That way, uh, you're not tearing your hair out uh, trying to figure out why things are dropping frames uh, because those profiles in there really, really, really smooth things out. I mean, you could spend 10 hours troubleshooting something, and by then you've paid for the hardware. So anybody who's who's looking at getting switches for for managed, for needing to do stuff with NDI and Dante, I strongly recommend the, the Netgear. FS is also a, a good uh, recommendation for unmanaged if you do want to uh, go that route and you just need to power up stuff and you're still going to go down SDI or HDMI out of your cameras. So two different two different routes to go, but buy once, cry once. I say get the 4250s if you possibly can squeeze it through the budget. Just ask for a little bit more because <laughs> six, seven, eight hundred bucks can make a big difference in pulling your hair out later and having to rip everything out and learn it all over again. Yeah, and, and for the if you are just looking for an unmanaged switch, uh, the the Netgear um, I have a couple of them um, that aren't the managed ones. I haven't been able to. I haven't, I've just been spending that extra money somewhere else so far. But I may a forty two fifty is on my list of things to get for my office. Um, but those the Netgears have been pretty good as far as uh, PoE plus um, plus. Next question, Paul Wallace, Austin, Texas. Talk about the death of the follower and the future of creativity on the web with Jack Conti at. South by Southwest, and he's got a link there to, I guess, that speech or presentation. Yeah, that's, that's a hard question for us to really process in a show. <laughs> so, um, you know, I don't, I don't know. I think, you know, I think a lot of times, uh, I'm not sure what Jack's talking to with this in this specific case. I don't know if anyone else was able to see it, but uh, we probably need a little more context uh, in the questions to to jump on them there. So maybe you can ask that again with more with more context. Um, um, next question. Douglas Carmichael says, when balancing electrical loads on a larger scale system, do you calculate them manually using a spreadsheet or can a system building tool like H2R take those loads into account? Um, we calculate them pretty manually and we then check them. <laughs> you know, so, so trust but verify. So you make a lot of calculations. Um, I, I make calculations against the maximum load of every piece of equipment that's there. Not the average load, not the projected load, but if I'm going to build something, I want my power to be somewhere between 50 and 100 percent. So 150 to 200 percent of what my uh, of, that's my availability of the max load of all the equipment that I have. Um, then I have plenty of headroom, uh, you know, getting into th something that's closer headroom really, you know, 
we've had entire stadiums go out during the during the Super Bowl <laughs> because you know people were cutting it a little closer than they should. So um, so you want to kind of uh, keep that in mind as you as you work through it. Uh, go ahead, Bill. I endorse Alex's approach. Listen, this basic math, if you're, you're adding up all the draws of all the pieces of equipment and then you're adding a comfortable margin in between is the kind of math you could do at your head on site. You know, you have a 20 amp circuit or two 20 amp circuits or something else, three phase. And so the basic math is not that hard and you should always do it because you always want to stay on inside of that. Whether the margin for you is 50 percent or 30 percent or more is up to how comfortable you are with the risk involved in overdrawing power and have breakers going, things like that. But the basic math is pretty simple. It's not hard to do in your head. Next question. Uh, Jonathan Hall in Knoxville, Tennessee is up next. And Jonathan says, anyone using slow, show flow rundown from Cvent to call your shows? It looks to be far superior to the standard QSeat or Google Doc with real-time show flow updates to the production team. It could limit so many individual conversations with staff. Go ahead, Ron. Uh, yeah, so I, I used it uh, for a few different events, uh, show show flow and i found it to be very helpful um but it wasn't it wasn't dramatically helpful because it costs something like five grand a year um for the subscription to it and it wasn't that much better than google sheets and what was really interesting is seeing different companies that were using just google sheets um and then some people using show flow now where it comes into its own is really when you have a large team and they want to be able to um, customize the view they have and you want to have things like the script and things like that as well, right? And so you could you can run auto cues from it and you can, you know, like uh, teleprompters and things like that. So it is, it is particularly good. But I tell you something that's worth checking out is Rundown Studio um, is um, so uh, um, John... John Barker, um, and uh, and so um, here to record, um, have have kind of created this new thing um, called Rundown Studio, and is um, kind of like a, a light version that really covers a whole bunch of things. Um, and, and we're starting to move across. Uh, we were looking for something that handled time zone support. You know, when, with lots of these online events where we're spanning lots of time zones. And so Rundown Studio looks like it now supports time zones. And so we're playing around with that. Um, so it, it really is, it's the teams. What I have, what I would say is we've ran a lot of events on on Sheets, um, Google Sheets. Um, and you can do some amazing thing with, with filtered views and things like that. So, yeah. Yeah, I... We, we, we've definitely used Rundown. Uh, we've done, used uh, Showflow in the past. The problem that we had with Showflow, and this is years ago, and they were very, you know, they worked with us on it. I, the first version of Showflow, I think, didn't only worked on Wi-Fi, which we were like, oh, we need Ethernet to to make that actually uh, a usable solution in a product. Um, but the, uh, but we worked with them on it, and we, you know, um, there's a couple different. There's um, there's also I think Rundown Creator, which is another another version of these. We've used a lot of these. The problem is we end up coming back to Sheets because we need a. We keep on wanting to customize the layout. And so a lot of these, if you do them in the lay, if you want to, if you follow the layout that they have, and they've got some flexibility, but if you really, you really have to kind of follow the program there. And that's always been the problem. That's why everyone keeps on falling back to sheets is because they're trying to, you know, they're, yeah, that's the issue we have <laughs> is that people keep on, we want, keep on wanting to customize something about it that we can't customize and show flow the way we want to. And then we end up going back to sheets and everyone knows how to use sheets and we don't have to ramp anybody up and you know that's so that's been the challenge that we've had um we keep on thinking there's got to be a better tool we keep on testing them i'm we're looking at john barker's run you know um rundown tool to do that um because you know we 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 know that we since we know the developer we think we can make requests and get what we what we're hoping for um so so we have a lot of because it's john barker uh we definitely have um, an interest in that product um but still the, the you know the a lot of times we don't even generate the sheets. The sheets are generated by a client. They're generated by somebody else. So we're still working through that that process. And I and I will admit the other issue is is that um, after doing probably I don't know um, 
1,500 to 2,000 shows with some kind of rundown um, of them. I have a tendency to not like complicated rundowns. So I think that's the other problem is that I don't, I feel like all the pomp and circumstance is a little bit, uh, you know, I just tire of it, <laughs> you know, like, and so I feel like there's a whole lot of cues and we're not really getting to the meat of the matter. Um, and so, you know, they're, they're not real discussions. And so my, a lot of my rundowns are very complicated in the pre-show and very complicated in the post-show. And once we get to the middle, we go, and then we will discuss, <laughs> you know, like, like we do in this show. You know, there's a whole bunch of cues and then there's not as many cues. Um, and so, uh, and I, I have to admit, those are the kind of shows that I enjoy. I will say, by the way, if you haven't seen the NVIDIA, uh, the NVIDIA stage event is one of the few stage events that I've enjoyed in probably the last five years. Um, the I, NVIDIA did an AI. And now, it's both terrifying, exciting, and really well done, <laughs> like all those things of what they're showing there. Um, they're showing how what, where NVIDIA is going with AI, uh, the future of programming, their, their view of the future of programming, their view of the future of robots, their view, view of the, you know, all of these different things. And it, it's really interesting. But I thought that the, that um, Jensen did an amazing job at, at presenting it. And, um, and, it's, and it was, you know, re remarkably well done for a stage event. But that's been the only one that I've seen that I was like, okay, this might actually work in maybe five years. Yeah, go ahead, Grant. I was just going to add that one of the things that I liked about Showflow was was an um, individual views for each one of the team members yeah. and particularly the notes field, right? So so you could really say um, uh, the, the lighting operator can see all those cues, sees the lighting cues specifically, and then any notes that they want to make specifically for, for them that nobody else needs to see. And and in some ways you could do that with sheets, like the, the filtered views is very powerful, the different views that you can do um, in sheets. And so you can almost get there um, and you just have all these columns that you're sort of hiding. But if you really need that to sort of be private or you don't want you don't want those notes to sort of every everyone's notes to to be available for everyone, um, but that that's a huge jump from free <laughs> to to multiple thousands of dollars a year um, subscription. So um, it, it's amazing what Google Sheets can do. Yeah, I do. I do really. That's the the thing that got us interested in um, in in, in uh, Showflow was specifically what Grant was talking about, which is the idea that that I could have the audio folks just have their own cues, the video folks have their own cues. You're going through the cue list. There's a master cue that someone's going through and it's moving everybody's, but they don't have to look at every every line that's in front of them. Um, so that is that is the biggest advantage, in my opinion, of that product. It just, again, the format ended up breaking up into, you know, into things that we had other people that wanted to customize or didn't or wanted something else. Or you just have a lot of producers that are really comfortable with sheets. And, you know, the best tool in the world, unless... And and this is this is the challenge I think they have. And Cvent probably has a. It's a little easier for them because they manage their own events. The challenge is is that you have lots and lots. When you put together a large event, you have lots of lots of disparate companies coming together and trying to work together. And if a couple don't know how to use the product that you're using, nobody uses it. <laughs> you know, like and so it gets dropped out. And that's why Sheets is so popular is that everybody knows how to use Sheets or they can learn quickly. Everyone knows how to use a spreadsheet. And so what ends up happening is, is that the lowest common denominator wins all the time at these events because we're never going to see each other again or we won't see each other very often. And, you know, this week is going to be with this, this company and the next week is going to be with somebody else. And so I think that's the other challenge. If you were doing, I think that if you were doing shows that's 100% internal capacity and you were able to work through the training and, and build through that process, it would be, it's much easier. And I think, again, that's why it plays into what Cvent does because that's what they do. And, you know, so it's a good internal tool for them that they can sell to other people. Uh, go ahead, Grant. Yeah, I was. I just remembered another killer feature for for Showflow is following the show caller, and so right. you can you can check you can check. I want to follow the show caller, and whatever their whatever line they're on, um, everyone you know is following that. Yeah. Um, and while you can sort of do that in sheets, as in you can click the name of the person and you can see where their cursor is, you know, it'll take you to where they they are. Um, to have that automatic for all the operators to just be able to to have that show flow, uh, you know, automatically scrolling to to the next the correct line, that's pretty cool. But it, that feels like a little 
um, plugin really that someone needs to just write for <laughs> for Google Sheets to just constantly, you know, keep following and, and tracking yeah. um, one person, one user that's logged into it. Yeah, absolutely. Next question. Next one comes to us from Eric Price in Kansas City, Missouri. And Eric says, uh, I see that the Logitech Mevo Core Micro Four Thirds camera that was discussed this weekend was officially announced about an hour ago, retailing for $999. Thoughts on the pricing? Uh, it uh, looks pretty amazing. I mean, it's a pretty amazing camera for, for what it does. Um, it is, uh, this is really um, building a web camera slash HDMI output. Micro Four Thirds, it kind of almost goes up. It takes what we were doing, a lot of us were doing with the, um, you know, with the micro studios that, that Blackmagic made, but it gave it a USB output, <laughs> which I don't think that, the, I don't think even the new Blackmagic studios do that. And so it's a pretty interesting product. We saw it, we saw it rumored last week. It's a really interesting one uh, this week. Go ahead, Guy. Yeah, I wish it was just a little bit cheaper because, yeah, like Alex said, going up against the uh, Black Magic, I mean, you got 995 bucks, same price. Uh, sure, you don't have the USB output, but what are you going to do with it? I guess that's the question is if, if it's just going into a computer, you're saving what uh, you can buy a cheap capture card for under $100. But now you have the versatility uh, with Blackmagic. If you have a ATEM switcher, you could shade that camera. You have batteries that are uh, industry standard batteries with the Mevo. You're, you're kind of locking yourself into an ecosystem that, uh, I mean, Logitech's a good camera company. You know, over the years, they've sold <laughs> quite a few cameras. They're probably the, the leader in that space. And when YOLO Live uh, showed at IBC, this same, I think it's the same camera, essentially, uh, they... They were talking more like the $800 range, so I was thinking 800 bucks, and that's about right to me. A uh, thousand's kind of like, eh. Well, that's a good MSRP a lens. too. Like we'll see what happens, uh, you know, a little bit, a little bit of the ways in. But yeah, go ahead, Bill. Yeah, that's that. That's the retail price. I wonder what the street price is going to turn out to be. Obviously, they'll try to sell it as high as possible and see what the market demand says. Um, I, when I first thought, I thought, do I, you know, who's going to spend a thousand dollars? Then I realized I have a Black Magic Six case sitting behind my monitor, so I'm, you know, not the person to say that. If you want to have a really, really, really solid uh, web ap appearance, and that's important for your presentation to the world as a professional. I can see a lot of people maybe going in this direction. The question is how many people don't already have that solved and will need to come into this. So I think it's a little bit of a coin toss whether this is going to be a big hit or a modest one. I also would come back to what about the autofocus? <laughs> like, you know, so you've got a micro four thirds. Uh, you're putting those lenses on the front. I mean what, what kind of moved me towards Sony you know, for my, my web kit is the autofocus. And, the, um, uh, and so I think that that is um, – I, that the micro four thirds is great and you can really get a nice short depth of field, but, but what kind of focus are you going to get there? Um, and, uh, and so I think that that's going to be interesting if, cause the reason that that's really important is the way I see this camera is a real low, low, um, lift for sending to executives. You're talking about, you know, you know, you can just plug this in and make it work. The problem you get into is, once you shorten that depth of field, once you have that higher quality, you're going to need a lens and you're going to need autofocus to make that actually work. Um, and so I think that that's the challenge. That's the challenge for Black Magic is not having, you know, really great autofocusing to do this kind of thing. Um, I do think that there's a huge demand for what Logitech is doing. I think I do agree with Guy that it's probably two hundred dollars more than what most. I mean, at at six ninety nine, seven ninety nine, you sell as many as you can make. <laughs> you know, like at at nine ninety nine, people are gonna um, they're gonna oscillate a little bit related to that. And again, I think that the problem that you get into is that autofocus there. But um, we'd love, uh, you know, I love to test one. It looks like a, it looks like you could produce a really good, really good uh, show with these, especially going into some kind of software like VMix or or Mimo Live or other things like that. Being able to just have a bunch of USB cameras plugged into a, into a laptop or into something else is pretty interesting. So, so it, it'll be interesting to see it. There is a lot of, I know that there's a lot of lift in the way that, that we do it. The other one, by the way, that I'm really pining after, which is a lot more expensive is the L LR1 from Sony. Um, it is the, it's basically a full frame. It's like this one, but a full frame sensor and half the width. <laughs> so, and, uh, I was talking to someone about it. I was like, I don't, I just don't know if it, uh, the, Sony's not promoting it very much. I don't know if it's going to sell. And they were like, yeah, they're selling as many as they can make. <laughs> like, like they are, they're, you know, they're, there's a, they're, the reason they're not promoting it that much is because they don't need to. So, um, so I'm, I'm hoping to get a hold of one of those to test those because that's basically like the A7S, but without any of the body. 
like it's just a sensor box, you know, that's there. So that's another one to look at too. Uh, next question. Tlaloc Lopo's Waterman in Wilmington, Delaware is up next. Has anyone used the Zcam SDI backpack? And if so, how much latency did it introduce? And he's got a link there. Go ahead, guy. Yeah, I chose to stay away from the backpack because I didn't need it the way that uh, somebody else would in the field need it. Uh, so that one's a 3G SDI where that camera, the HDMI is capable of 4K output. So what you're seeing me through right now is a Zcam E2 and it feeds into a bird dog uh, um, 4K converter via f its 4K coming out of that HDMI. And then I convert it to NDI and, and bring it in. And then I also convert it to SDI because that converter has both. It has uh, a NDI and SDI. So it depends on what you want to do. But I would probably just go with a, a decimator and if it's an install and uh, just know that those guys are the best at the business. And, and if you're concerned about latency, um, that they'll be the, the best game in town. But the other thing is if you're using this for iMag, just be careful and, and uh, do a little more research to make sure that end to end going, if it's going to a projector, uh, what does that workflow look like converting from HDMI to SDI? Or, and you might want to go fiber in there, uh, depending on the run and the distance and all of that, because you might have a couple bits of conversion going on to get from the switcher or if there is a switcher involved. So just if, if latency is a concern, it's end to end, not just you know one hop. You got to figure out where your final destination is. Yeah, I wouldn't use anything that does. I wouldn't put any converters in a pipeline that it was going to iMag. Like you need gen locked SDI. <laughs> like, like that's 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 the cameras all have to be gen. I totally agree with Guy. I'm actually pretty fascinated by this. I didn't even know it existed. Um, I, you know, that was one of my big problems with Zcam was like I don't want an Ethernet cable. I want a baseband, and um, and I just didn't realize they made until until this question. I did not realize they made an SDI converter. Um, my guess is so the the you know the um, I completely agree with Guy that the decimator is is the best in the business. There is a fair bit of latency in it. You know, so there's a solid three or four frames that you lose going through it. Um, and so uh, you can feel it when I'm using it for certain things. But but the, uh, um, but the this is a really, that's interesting. You know, it, 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 the only way to know is to test it. Um, next question. Next one comes from Andre Dahle in Berlin. And Andre says, recommendations on getting started with SRT setups and according network knowledge to use it via the internet. Guy. Okay. Yeah, there's this site called Office Hours Global. Uh, if you go really? to it and you type in SRT in the top corner, um, you'll hit this SRT lab. There's a video in there that shows a bunch of us going through the basics of how to send. Uh, so we got a group of us uh, and just started using things like uh, Larix Broadcaster and, and OBS to test. Uh, and I used to do this. I was trying to do it every every week was basically fire up a, an Amazon instance running uh, a receiver so people can... It was like the Brady Bunch, you know, there's a nine up. In fact, you can see it in this one. Actually, this one is SRT mini server, that, but it's the same type of thing where there's a receiver up in the cloud and you can see that there's signals coming into it. So everybody could, uh, could log in and shoot their signal up and then we would take it full screen and talk about it and just check the latency and things like that. So that's, that'll get you started. And then from there, you could start to watch. There's some great videos on uh, YouTube showing... Um, how some of the gamers are doing it. So some of the gamers are, you know, they don't want to spend a bunch of money. So doing it with OBS is one way. Uh, Wirecast is another way that's pretty inexpensive. And then we love vMix. We do a lot of SRT with vMix. And then there's hardware, of course. There's some inexpensive, uh, no-name uh, brands of uh, converters that'll do it for under 200 bucks. But then there's also some really nifty stuff from uh, Magewell and some of the other big players like Epifan that'll give you hardware encoders that really give you H.265 and you don't have to worry about the computer crashing because you're overloading it. Uh, but yeah, Larix Broadcaster, well, it's not free anymore. It was when we did the uh, the class, but uh, now it now it costs a, a, a little bit uh, to remove the watermark. But if you just want to play with it, you can play with the watermark and uh, Larix Broadcaster and then a receiver like OBS will do the trick. Next question. Next one comes to us from Andy Kokendorfer in Vieira, Florida, and he says YouTube has added a voluntary notice of AI content to Creator Studio. Should we have to reveal the use of generative AI in our media productions? Go ahead, Bill. It's a fascinating topic, and the question is how much, because I would argue that almost everybody is using some form of AI in their regular work now. I mean, if you're uh, checking scripts or getting language yeah, from it, but, uh, they're talking Renee, about specific... 
But Renee, Renee, Renee Ritchie uh, put out a post. Uh, he's he's the liaison for YouTube yesterday to clarify this just a little bit. Just while before you answer, <laughs> the, hmm. uh, they're only talking about video and stills. So they're not talking about any use of AI um, in scripts, uh, in development, even thumbnails. So they're really just talking. They're really talking about how AI is going to be used in your video and the core content of your of your YouTube. That's what YouTube's asking for right now. Right, and what I was heading for is where is the line? If you're using it for something in those categories that I think we all accept again, it for saying research and things not, like that. They're not, they're not drawing the line there. But you're getting to, how about audio? Is no, generative but, audio, generative video, where is this line going to end up? And in the overall... Um, Trying to be truthful to your audience, at, if you know, if you're replacing logos in a shot via AI as opposed to j changing the look of the shot, that's just. It seems to me it's always going to be a difficult and fuzzy line. Everybody can kind of come up with the reasons that this is false. You're just making up a character and making up words and putting out something that is wholly unnatural. I guess. Um, Everybody wants to eliminate or at least suppress or at least inform the audience about that. But nobody wants to try to say this is where the line should be in terms of using these incredibly powerful tools to shape messaging and broadcast. That's to me where the where the really rubber hits the road. I think it's good. It's it's good CYA for the for YouTube to say this. It's good um, PR for them to kind of push down this path. I think it creates a false sense of security, as Bill points out. Um, I just don't think you're going to know. And I think that thinking, well, it's not, it doesn't say it, so it must be true, uh, is a pretty dangerous thing to have. I think that you should not trust anything by itself. Nothing on its face should be trusted th at this point um, and probably shouldn't have been for quite some time. Um, but, but I think that uh, you know, should always be looking at multiple sources, particularly multiple sources that conflict with each other on a day-to-day -day basis. Reporting on the same thing is probably accurate or more accurate. Uh, I wouldn't say accurate, accurate. Um, you know, I, I once, uh, you know, uh, the, the um, I was, I was once having a discussion with a, a music artist named Billy Bragg. And, uh, and he said, you know what the Republicans should call themselves? We were the political cousin. Uh, discussion. He goes, this is political, but it's not political. He said, you know what the, 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 uh, the um, he said, the, you know what the Republicans should call themselves? And I said, what? And he said, the capitalist party. And he said, you know what the Democrats should call themselves? And I, and I said, what? And he said, the other capitalist party, you know, and, 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 um, and, uh, and, and the point is, is that from a point of reference, from your point of reference, uh, everything may, the, you know, the things that look conflicting to you may not be conflicting to others. They may be all the same. So you just have to kind of keep, keep track of that. But I think that, you know, we're getting to a point where you really shouldn't, you should really look at everything sideways. Everything I see now, if I see an article that someone says something outlandish that, that is, can you believe this is happening? I'm like, I don't even know if it is happening. <laughs> like, I don't like, I'm going to, we're going to, I'm going to need to check it a couple times, do some searches, see it, you know, and, and I think that this, the user learning to slow down the, their uh, decision process, slow down their judgment process is pretty valuable. You know, and I think we should be pushing really hard for people to slow down your knee-jerk reaction to everything. And I think all the stuff that we've done over Twitter and over all these other things over the last two decades of, I'm going to see something and immediately be angry and then start posting things about it. Um, I think we need to start, you know, start, I think this is a good example of why we need to start cooling our jets a little bit, you know, and just go, well, we're going to have to see if this is actually the, the case or not. Yeah, go ahead, Grant. Yeah, I, I think it's an interesting, you know, world that we're going into. And I don't mind this idea that, uh, you know, when you're watching TV for years or even movies, mainly TV, where you'd see like a, a an artist, it, it would say an artist depiction or, you know, like it'll have just a little, little something that that tags it. Yeah, a little disclaimer. And and I think I like that idea on YouTube that that it it doesn't it takes away that need for us to look at it and go, hang on. And then you sort of see the uncanny uncanny valley aspect to it. But having a little bug or something that just says like, yeah, this was this was AI generated or something, um, is helpful. But you know, th there's an another thing my my uh, my wife is at university uh, at the moment and they're really struggling with uh, the use of AI generated text, right, in their assignments. And so what they've tried to do um, as, as, to, as a way to combat it is they have this online program now that you're not allowed to use, you know, Word or, or Google Docs or your own word processing process for making your assignment. You have to write your assignment 
in this online program so that they can see that, you know, they can see the keystrokes went in at this time and they can see that, you know, how all the words, it wasn't just copied and pasted from somewhere else. Yeah, it was, they can it was see just, that, you, just, you just had another screen open and you were typing it while you were looking at the uh, other screen. Exactly. I know. And of course, my mind goes to using key loggers and things. I mean, there's like even splash top, you can, you can use it where, it, where you can paste using keystrokes. So I was like, I would totally just copy from, you know, from chat GPT and then paste as keystrokes. And, um, and if you can have it vary the keystrokes, uh, um, frequency or something and make it look more human or something, yeah. I mean, you, you start to think it's not, it's not a long-term solution, the, the university system. I'm like, this is here, AI for research and for, and for the, um, creative process, I think is here to stay. And so we need to find ways of using it. Um, and find other ways of of determining whether that was, um, you know, by the person or not. So it's an yeah, interesting I, world. I think it, yeah, I think I do think for creative things, for creative output, for things that are like news, I think that, again, I, I don't think that any amount of self-declarations de- is going to help. And I'm, I'm afraid, again, I'm afraid that it creates a false sense of security. But I, but I think that... Um, uh, as far as the creative, I, I, when you come to university, my, my son, someone, a couple kids, not my son, uh, uh, use chat GPT to answer some of their, answer some of their essays or whatever in one term. Now the teacher's trying to make them handwrite all everything in class so they can avoid it. And I'm like, you got to figure out a way to embrace it. Like you got to figure out how are you going to use chat GPT, you know, like that, that is going to, um, you know, figure out how are they using the prompts? How are they building those th- things? And, and for instance, pre- presenting things, like I think that having to present the content is way more powerful. Like just get past the, you know, I, 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 I think that if you love to write, then you should write. You know, if you don't love to write, I have not, I've written one paper longer than 10 pages in 30 years, 30 years you know like you know i've run one paper longer than 10 10 pages and it was painful it was really painful and um i could i had to write it and there's no way i could have written it with chat gpt because it was all like this is based on the research that we just did and it was me breaking down all this research of what i was doing and how i was putting it together and everything else um and uh the but but everything else has been dex everything Everything has been decks, 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 decks and demos, decks and demos, decks and demos. That's what the corporate world lives on is I'm going to give you some visual rep because that's what moves ideas down the path, not papers. You know, I guess in Amazon, you re- you, <laughs> you can do these papers where everyone reads them. And that is just insanity. Like, like literally when I saw that, I was like, I'll never work there. Like ever, like, you know, like I would never work in something so insane. And so the, um, but the, but if you look at all these big companies, they're all, the machine is all about decks and demos. And we, and somehow we were obsessed with writing as opposed to having kids using mid journey and, and GPT and building up things and doing great demos where they have to present them in front of their class. That would be, I think, a way more useful time, use of their time than especially handwriting things. Um, next question. Next question comes to us from Gabriela Asuncio Mastira in Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan. It is said that you should just rely on yourself because trusting someone else is only the path to the silent ghost. What does this mean to your independence and creative freedoms? How does this work in a business where you always have to hire others? I don't know who said that. I go ahead, Grant. Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure. This is a this is a tricky one. And, someone, and, and, someone, a very angry curmudgeon said that at some point. So it was probably yeah. said, but I don't know. <laughs> anyway, go ahead, Grant. I tell you, I think I, I think what is um, a domain for for a lot of us as freelancers who, who, who have started out as freelancers is how do you scale? Like how does how do you start working um, on larger projects where you need more than just yourself? Um, and so it, there, there comes a time where you need to be able to rely on other people and, and build the team and know that someone has what it takes and that you've, and that there's kind of that apprentice type model that they've, they've seen how you work, um, and they've picked it up and they've ran with it. And I, which leads me to, to talk more around the character of the people that you choose more so than their technical knowledge or their or their ability and their skills and abilities because the skills and abilities can 
be taught and they can learn those. But it, it has to be the character of the person that you that you choose. And so um, we're going through a phase with my company in Australia at the moment of, of scaling, needing to scale because we have multiple. This weekend I've got three different events, online events that are happening. And so I can't. I can't be. I'm, I'm going to. I'm going to try to be in all three places at once, um, but uh, but I can't be. I need to have team members that that I know I can trust that are going to to run it. Um, and when I was looking for those people, I was looking for the character of the people. You know, it, it really was. And then uh, probably like sixty percent character and you know forty percent ability, knowing that they can actually do it. But it really is. The characters of, of the people that um, that I was looking for first, because I knew, particularly people that are client facing, people that are going to be talking to the clients and things like that. I I, I want to trust that they can uh, they can do that appropriately, and then know that my company can scale because um, I have to trust people. So, I think if you want to if you want to not trust anyone and just do it yourself, then you limit your capacity um, for your for your income and for your um, you know, for your work, because now you're really just going to be selling your time. You're going to sell your hours and that's it. And yeah. at some point so, that's going to dry up. It's a hard way to live. <laughs> Go yeah. ahead. Go ahead, Bill. Well, this is to me about curating trust in people. And I, I think you've got to give people the chance. You know, in the last question, we were talking about uh, generative and and can you do the work or is this dissertation entirely written by an AI model. It can write it, but can it defend it? At some point, you're going to be in front of other people, and they're going to be judging how you present yourself and how your mind works, really. I mean, that's kind of the core. And the question is, when it comes to the point somebody says, ideas, who's going to raise their hand? And in real time, not generatively, you have to not only articulate your thought process, but defend it against others. And that's always been the kind of the Socratic method of moving society forward. So if you totally rely on these tools to generate and edit and do that, and then you're going to put that out as your own, if wow. you didn't really think that through, you're going to find yourself in trouble later because somebody's going to ask you how you came well, up with it. And if you don't have a process, an algorithm mentally well, that you went through to divide that thought, you're going to be in trouble. Yeah, I, I, I don't know if that means that or, or to or, or just working with other people. I'm not sure this is an AI question, but the the um, uh, you can't get anything done that's important by yourself. <laughs> like, like I'm just letting you know, like you can't, like you're just not going to get there. You can do a lot of things by yourself and you can be an artist by yourself. You can maybe be a writer by yourself. But if you actually want to undertake anything that matters in the world, you're going to need to do it with people. And you're going to have to find a way that you're going to organize with people to do that. Um, that's the reality. And so it's not a matter of trust. It's a matter of necessity. And then what you need to do is you need to build systems in which people will show themselves and you can slowly get to know them. And you get to know whether, you know, whether they're trustworthy, whether they're trustworthy for you, whether they're tr trustworthy enough. Um, these are all things that you have to, you know, it's, it's not a, there's no black and white here. There's a lot of gradients of people are good at this and not good at that. And people are, are, are effective at this, but they might be really effective, but really hard to deal with that. You know, there's all these <laughs> different options there and you have to figure out how to take all these puzzle pieces and turn it into teams. Um, and I haven't found anything that I, that, that we could do that mattered in the last 40 years uh, that I've, that I've run some kind of a team, um, uh, that, Need, that couldn't that could be done by myself you know like so you're gonna have to figure it out um, next question brian schwartz in baltimore maryland's up next for photography not video editing and organization could you compare the corel draw tools versus the adobe tools uh i don't know anybody that uses corel anymore so I, that's all I can say is, I mean, like, like if you build something, if you send me something, all I can say is if you send me something in Corel Draw, I'm not going to take you seriously ever. Like again, like it's not like, I mean, I'm sure that you can do it, but I'm like, like it's, you know, you can send me something in Affinity or in Pixelmator and I'll just be like, oh, you don't want to buy Photoshop, I understand. And there's a lot of good tools there, but Corel Draw is, uh, I, I, I'm, it must have some vertical that keeps it alive, but I, you know, I, I literally, I literally have not seen a Corel Draw document in twenty years. Yeah, go ahead, guy. 
Yeah, I had the opportunity to step into Peter Hurley's group. He's uh, probably the best headshot photographer in the world. And uh, listening to what tools that these guys use, uh, not only you know the cameras, but the, the back-end software. Some of them were Lightroom users, uh, but a lot of them were Capture One users. So not only just uh, answer your question, uh, going sideways, uh, it's look at other uh, more well-used uh, software packages. Uh, Affinity would be on the cheap end, but capture one on the high, high end. So if you're comparing Adobe Lightroom versus uh, something more modern, uh, I don't think Corel's even in the running. So uh, yeah, I, 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 it's been a while since I've heard it. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a while since I, I, that I heard it. And, you know, so I, yeah, I don't think it's really a thing anymore. Um, it, I'm sure somebody's using it because they're comfortable with it, but, but uh, it's not really a production tool. Uh, next question. Mariella Sushimaira in Weebelow says, when the rising prices on Ultimate Flat Focus Tool and other products in its 36 to 48 millimeter, I guess, or 36 to 48 waiting list, should we buy the knockoff entertainment industry tool from Monkey Wrench instead? They do have a banana tool too. Yeah, this is a flat tool. I'm trying to, I was trying to pull up the image here. Um, this is a flat tool in production that just lets you get to a lot of things. Um, that is, let's see here, this is the, this is what it looks like here. Um, and so you see this, um, this is kind of a, um, has a lot of different ways of grabbing onto C clamps and, and yoke bolts and so on and so forth. And so, uh, it's just a, it's a really popular tool. Um, if it's, you know, oftentimes the, the danger is, is that when you are, uh, if you're back ordered, People are going to buy something else if they need it. <laughs> so, so that's the. I think that's the danger that they're under. Is I don't. I don't see it being back ordered right now, but I. I could be. Let's see a black oxide. Um, so is yeah, it basically it just a little like wrench? I've never run across one of those. Uh, yeah, they're, these are wrenches that you see on set. Um, so okay, on stages so it's just to, quick to grab onto yeah. stuff. They're just they're flat. They're easy to pull around, and they can get to a lot of things and open them up. So they're they're pretty useful. Uh, I don't sense. use one that much, but I see one on you know uh, often. Uh, next question. Harshid Travidian, Daytona Beach, Florida is up next. What's your recommendation for an international converter to be able to use in India? I think it's the D plug to be able to charge your cell phone. I use laptops and items as such. Uh, you know, the, the thing to remember is, is that almost everything. So your walkie talkies might be, not be this way. Your iron, a blow dryer, those types of things, anything that, you know, that's that of that kind of ilk. Uh, is not going to be is going to be 120 or, or uh, 240. Almost everything else is 120 to 240. So almost everything you buy, your cell phone, your laptop, all many many of your electronic items. Now do look at it. Don't take my word for it, but do look at it. And so all you should need is a plug converter. So what you should need is a plug converter. So that that's just a you can get lots of them. Uh, there's so many different versions of this. I don't like. I'll be honest with you. I, I have a bunch of these ones that you can flip, you can slide little things in and out and, and the, you know, there's like all the converters of the world on them. Um, there's a lot of these made. Here's the problem with those is they lift the ground. And when you lift the ground to do that, so they just have a plastic piece that goes in where the ground would go in. It has some danger on its own. But the other thing is, is that when there is no ground, you become the ground. And you'll feel this little thing when you put your hand on your laptop, you'll feel like your laptop is your hand is floating a millimeter off your laptop. And the reason is, is because there's an electrical pulse going th from the laptop through your body to the ground. <laughs> you know, so, so, um, so the, uh, so you just want to, you know, be careful of that. So getting proper, in my opinion, getting proper single use uh, converters for India is the way to do that. And you can do a search for what the, what are the plugs for India? I think a lot of them look like the UK plugs. Um, a lot of there's a couple of different plugs that float around India, so you might want to look at that. But I would get the single ones that do carry the ground with them, so you'll see them because they have three metal uh, pieces to them in some configuration. I don't, I didn't have time to figure out during the show which one. I can't remember the one that I used in India, but I would highly recommend um, doing that. The other thing that I do is I do do ones that are all converters. These are strips by VCT, I believe, that have a they have a I, um, IEC C13 input. Um, so that you can actually take this one and just replace that cable. And you can get that C13 cable anywhere in the world. Any hardware store will have one. And so then you just buy the, you buy a strip that has the C13 input, and then you just can plug it into whatever you want. And that's a really effective way of getting around the world. Uh, next question. 
Mark Sanderson at Chesterfield in the UK has our first QR question in a little bit. What type of switcher would you recommend for someone wanting to start live streaming? ATEM Mini format, the Yolo Box, Magewell Mini format, or something like the ATEM but with a built-in screen? Uh, I, you know, if you don't have a computer um, and you're not going to do it in software and you're looking for some small box, I would still probably lean towards an ATEM Mini. I mean, I think as, as if you're getting started... It's pretty inexpensive, it's pretty stable, and it just does the thing. And you're now getting into an ecosystem that can grow up to the 8K constellation, and, and the interface is only going to change in a minor way. Um, so that makes it easier. It's got, you know, also an API, um, and then you have things like um, Adam Tao's um, Mix Effect Pro, which makes all of these tools way more effective. <laughs> so, so uh, you know, so I think that I would I'd probably stick with the A10 Mini. Um, next question. Hasma Gajar in Cape Town, South Africa, says, I need a Zoom poll report, but Zoom keeps reports for one month. Have the CSV poll report, but not an easy read. Any thoughts on how to format the, C, uh, the CSV report to be useful? I go, Bill. So CSV is just comma-separated values. So uh, most of the time, I used to just use Microsoft Word's full version to go in and do a replacement and replace the commas with something, either carriage returns or tabs or whatever was required for that particular uh, report. only takes a couple of minutes to do a whole report, and suddenly this gobbledygook mess of text turns into something readable. So you might try anything that'll do that replace character function. Again, I used to use Microsoft Word, but anything will do. And generally, a CSV is importable into Numbers, Excel, um, even uh, Sheets. So you can import those in, and generally, that a CSV will will immediately switch over to columns. Um, so if it's done properly, it can get a little confused when you have uh, when you have commas inside of your data. But if you um, but if it's uh, a common, you know, so if it uh, tab delimited or common delimited files, you can bring them in. And then, of course, once you have the C, what we do is we download CSVs from things like YouTube, you get a CSV down, bring them into numbers, and then you start building graphs with them and, and all kinds of pie charts and, you know, all the fun stuff. Right, go ahead, Grant. Yeah, I was just going to say, talking of AI before, that um, ChatGPT is great for for um, making a little script. There's a few different things you could do um, where you could say, um, write me a script that will convert CSV to a, um, to a pretty format in a, in a, in a Word document, for example. Um, but you could also use um, in Word or um, yeah in Word you could do a um, a mail merge type idea where you could you could then bring in all of that text um, and 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 format it in a nice way. So there's a few different ways you could do it. Um, I, I have actually also seen people doing as guy uh, sorry as Alex was talking about. Um, with Excel and doing graphs and things, I've seen people do some really cool things with Excel, um, with removing um, all the grid lines, and uh, and so you don't see the cells anymore, and formatting it in a way that's really uh, looks great, and then you can output it as a PDF. So you could use ChatGPT to give you some formulas to do that, um, and then it would get that would be a big head start for you if you wanted to make the whole thing look pretty. Next question. Tlaloc Lopez Waterman, Wilmington, Delaware. Zcam has a micro four thirds camera that has onboard NDI. Do any of the Super 35 or full frame options have NDI? Good guy. They don't. That's the only one is the one with four thirds, uh, which is uh, similar to the one that I have. Um, you want to be careful too, because there is different flavors of NDI. So the model that they do have is, is uh, called the N, so E2N, and it's uh, NDI HX. So NDI HX is not full NDI; it is a compressed version. So visually, you, it's for the pixel peepers. It's it's hard to to see the difference, but there is a difference between the high bandwidth and and this lower bandwidth mode. And then there, there's also an added latency and. Uh, when it has to decode on the other side, there is a hit to the processor. So there's things going on in that chain that you need to be aware of. So if it were me, I would try to find something that's full NDI or convert it with a bird dog uh, converter or another brand that will convert it to full full on. So any of the full frame cameras that you want, just convert it. And there you go. It, it is expensive, though. I mean, some of these converters cost four or five hundred bucks or more. Um, yeah. And the uh, yeah, FR7s have, have NDI, I believe. No, next question. 
Uh, next one's from Guy Cochran in Seattle. He's, Cochran's not throwing a Cochran. He's kind of throwing a Cochran lateral. Have Grant's views on the cloud changed in 2024? Go, go ahead. The Ron. rare Cochran lateral. <laughs> uh, yes, um, I, that, that is a, a beautiful Cochrane. Um, so yes, my, my views have changed. So um, actually related to the, the previous question about, um, about team and growing team, um, I have a particular event um, that Guy is familiar with, um, and that is that we, uh, we have a, an event that happens every two weeks that goes for three days. And so it's, it's a significant event every two weeks and what we what we had the reason that we were uh, that we got this work is that uh, it was really important. It was it's a Zoom and it uses Obvio and all of that. They were already an Obvio user, but they were having a problem with their rebroadcasting, and that was that um, they needed to play some videos that were um, critical that these videos would play, um, and they had problems with them playing out. And so, uh, with the previous production team, and so we knew that it's that it's really important that we had backup strategies, um, backups for the backups um, for being able to play out videos. And so immediately, uh, I knew that we needed to have more than one studio set up to be able to to back up. And so we ran this studio and um, uh, this studio is, is a ATEM, um, it's funny because it's an ATEM uh, ME2 is the, the, the main, uh, the two ME, um, the main system that runs, which is not that old, right? Um, we've got a whole bunch of current equipment in here. Um, but what has happened now is that what we did is we ran this studio as our primary and then we, we ran some cloud infrastructure, vMix in the cloud. Um, as a backup and sure enough we needed to cut to that uh to that backup in zoom and um and away it went and and it was great and very quickly we realized that we could run both of the studios in the cloud and have sort of cloud um have both of the systems running in the cloud and so this studio has now become the retro studio is what we're calling it um because because the cloud infrastructure is now the primary um, uh, uh, with with how we're running, and so uh, um, I think my my concerns with cloud before um, were that it didn't seem super reliable, um, and that the frame rate was was poor sometimes. And it, and in fairness, it probably was just my experience of it, um, and also me leaning towards wanting to be able to have the equipment in front of me or in front of the team and to be able to just touch the controls and, and, you know, to be able to see it. And so that, that has been an interesting thing to, uh, to play around with is now seeing vMix run, uh, like better than it does on local PCs. It runs perfectly in the cloud. Um, touch wood, I'm yet to see it crash in the cloud. Guy, have you seen it crash yet? I haven't um, seen it crash, but one of the things that I think of it now is it more like an appliance because of the switches that yeah. they use and the network that they use. It's all turnkey reliable. So when you go to Best Buy and buy a computer, you don't know what bloatware is going to be installed on there. When we spin up an instance in the cloud, we know what software is on there. And this is used by Citibank and some of these big players. So it's the same. It's the same stuff. So when we're running it now, it's just solid. So for these playouts, it, it, it just it, there's no hiccups because there's power redundancy, there's internet redundancy. And in fact, we're, you want to talk about how we're using two, two coasts. Yeah, exactly. And that, I think that that's what made it easier as well to have redundancy is to, is to say, okay, let's copy and paste this whole uh, infrastructure system, vMix and some Zoom rooms and some, you know, PowerPoint machine and, you know, like a series of instances that are all running in, the, in a, um, a virtual network. And so copy and paste that, put that in another region in the world, you know, and and now have a system of being able to synchronize in the control that you do. Um, and so we're using companion and companion satellite um, to be able to control those. And even that, I was a little concerned, well, man, we're, we're relying on this free software from companion to run our whole show. So 
actually being able to to separate that um, and have separate instances in different regions and be able to control those um, is pretty amazing. So yeah, I'm I'm kind of a convert to to the cloud for specific things. It's good to have you here. Grant. Hopefully, hopefully, we get to see you more often. It's good. Um, uh, uh, so, uh, coming up uh, next, of course, we're going to talk about one eight hundred eighty degree video uh, later this week. Um, tomorrow, we're going to talk about live to podcast. So, we're doing this thing where we're doing more and more, where we're doing a live show that ends up as a podcast. We do that here, but we're also doing it with uh, gray matter, and we're going to talk about what the what the challenges are related to that and how we're managing those challenges. Uh, we're going to talk about Apple compressor um, video, and you know, just how we use Apple compressor and go through some of the pieces on Thursday, and of course, Saturday and. Sunday are, um, are, are two hours on Saturday, up to two hours, depending on how many questions you ask. And on Sunday is more of an introspection day. So, uh, so stay tuned for all of that uh, this week. Welcome back to the second hour. And we're talking about 180 degree video and you're probably wondering why. Why are we talking about the 180 degree video? Uh, and that is, of course, because, uh, you know, we've seen Meta already moving more and more towards this. And Apple has is really embracing the 180 degree. So uh, the 180, we thought it would be good to have a little, a lot of times what we look for on these Tuesdays is, you may not be using this now, but ha but we're going to save you a little time on understanding why it's important and to think about it. So as you start to see things, you know, come through, you can start to pay more attention to them. 180 degrees is not going to be a big deal for probably another uh, 24 months, <laughs> 12 to 24 months, somewhere in that range. So we're, we're going to give you something. But now to put it in perspective, with Pixel Core, we used to say that like, hey, there's this thing called high dynamic range. <laughs> this was in 2005. Then we said there's this thing called high dynamic range and you're going to want to know how it works, you know, and there's a thing called photogrammetry and you're going to want to know how it works, you know, and we have people who have built their businesses around, you know, built their, move their career forward on understanding that, the, you know, the easiest way to really get into the industry um, is to find places that you're way ahead, not that you're going in, in from behind um, into something that's already been commoditized. So it's worth paying a cl close attention. I think the chances of 180 de degree video not succeeding is pretty low now. <laughs> like, you know, like it's, you know, now that Apple has kind of leaned into it, we have to remember that now I'm going to show you a little bit of how I got started in 180 degree, which interestingly enough was not with 180 degree. It was with um, 360 degrees. So the very first, uh, this is probably back. This is almost, so I put this up here. Um, this is, uh, I'm gonna, um, this is almost ten years ago. So this is this is um, this is almost ten years ago. And this is a if you look at it here, this is a three D printed. Uh, this is for GoPros. This was three D printed. This is whole rack. So what you had here is this was a um, here's the cameras, and all those cameras had little HD had little USB power. This is GoPros with USB power and HD little micro HDMI's. And we figured out how to get them all out of here. They came into this box. Here's a, here's some eight, some black magic hardware that allowed us to um, to uh, process it. Um, but then we also had um, a PC that I think is hidden down here that did the stitching. So it was doing live stitching. And here's an elemental that is streaming that. And we were streaming this from one part of uh, of uh, Menlo Park to um, to to the city. And so it was a, it was kind of a short um, a short run <laughs> in, in 2015. Uh, but this was kind of a proof of concept. But this is how we started thinking about this. It started thinking about um, 360 degrees. And um, printing these was a real pain, just in case you're wondering. Um, I'm now, there for your longboard dolly, though, that I saw in the background. That was awesome. Yeah, that was. This was <laughs> I'm glad you noticed. Oh, that yes. was, we had this idea that so we, 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 awesome. something. we had this, this we had this we had this dolly. <laughs> we couldn't, you know, it was, we were it was like a last minute thing, and we just couldn't find the right thing to do it. And so we actually <laughs> mounted this whole thing onto a. I actually got some model makers, the, the guys that we've used in model making, to mount the take this long board and mount mount the dolly, That's mount the awesome. whole pole on it. It was I'm glad you noticed that. That was <laughs> that was probably the most work in the whole thing. Um, anyway, so. Uh, and the idea was is that we could move it around. It turned out to not be a great idea because it shook too much and people put the, the thing, and, you know, it, it vibrate, you know, big, long pull, you know, like, but hey, you don't know until you do it. But what you, you learn when you do it, learn is by doing. it vibrates a it. lot. It's hard to stand up. It's hard to, like what, what we wanted it to be able to do is push it without us holding it. 
so that you could just kind of push it along and you'd feel like you were floating. But the problem we learned very quickly with with uh, with 180 and, and 360 is moving the camera makes people sick. You know, so you can't, and we'll get into that a little bit more. But anyway, so so we started there. Um, and this is this gets into being in the right place at the right time oftentimes is, so oftentimes if you want to be in the right place at the right time, you start working on that thing a long time in advance. <laughs> like, so th- then then being in the right place is easy because you're just standing around the whole time waiting for the, the time to show up because you're already in the place that needs it needs to be at. And that's what we're trying to look at here. Like my, the first 360 stuff I did was in 20, 2001, you know, and that was all still photography. Through, oh no, I'm sorry, uh, 1994 was one of the first time I did um, spherical you know, photography with, there was a thing you had to write, you had to write scripts inside of, I think it was called M, MVC or MVC in uh, Apple had the script that you could turn it into quick times. And so we would take pictures of them with film, you know, and, uh, and, and then um, we would scan those with this little Nikon scanner. And then we'd bring all these in and you got to make sure they're in the right order. And then you write this little script and it would turn it into a quick, a, a quick time VR um, little thing. So that's, that was my first experience with this. Um, and then we kept on moving. The, the first video work was probably early to, you know, tw- 2012, 2013. And then this was, but because I had been doing all of that, I got invited to like, hey, can you help with this? Because, you know, we need, to, we need to figure this out. Then that led to, so this work uh, led to this. So we were, um, this is the Ozo launch uh, for Nokia. So Nokia brought us in to do these. And this was a 360, these are 360 cameras. Um, I have one back here somewhere. Um, anyway, so this is, um, but these are 360 cameras here that we had. Um, and so we had multiple 360 cameras with dancers and bands and so on and so forth. And this is, this is probably a year later, 2016. Um, so that, that we, and we figured those things out there. Um, and so these were, you know, Nokia had been working on them for a while. They were really expensive at the time. They, I think the first one, the first one, the first one that I got was $60,000. The next two were uh, $30,000 each. And then the last three were $7,500 each. So they, they, it felt that it, it dropped off quickly um, as far as the costs go. But we learned a lot by doing the 360. We learned again that, for instance, there's a, we, we had these, this one's on a jib. And we found that moving, again, moving the camera, painful for a lot of people. The other thing you start to realize as you do this is that the area behind, as we started to do these, was not nearly as important as the area in front. There was very rarely, what it did is it created a much, it was much harder for us to stitch these together because we were trying to manage 360 degrees. If we only did um, stere- uh, stereo, we only had to look forward and it was a lot, a lot simpler. Um, this is what it looks, what a 360 looks like. This is actually from the Mars set in Budapest. Um, uh, this is for this, the dis- uh, Discovery Mars, that's for National Geographic. It had the thing called Mars. This is one of the control rooms. And so this is what, but we had all of this is behind you, right? And this is the 180 that's in between. And so, um, so anyway, so this is, you know, this part, usually when we were doing something, wasn't ha- there wasn't a lot happening there and trying to manage it was really difficult. And here's another one here where we finally figured out how to, you know, wire this. We actually machined these so that they would, we could control the Ozos. But here's at a large event. And um, so this is a big event and it's all in 360. Um, uh, And the problem that we had here, again, was who wants to see this? Like, you know, I'm, you know, I don't mean to be rough about the audience, but you just didn't need to see the audience. And the other thing is, is that we learned very quickly using this. We, um, we learned that the audience isn't conscious that you can see them either. <laughs> so, so they do all kinds of goofy things behind, uh, you know, we were, we had one front and center at a concert and um, you know, the people behind us were doing things that probably, they probably wouldn't want to broadcast, but it was a 360. We, was, we were fortunate. It was a test 360. It was not going out to the public, but we probably would have had to figure out how to map that out. You know, like they were, you know, they were just having a, a great time at the party, you know, and not thinking about, I'm sure they thought about, oh, that's a cool camera. But at some point after, you know, having a good time, they forgot that it was there. And, and, and so the, the main thing is, is that we realized that that's probably not something that you actually want to see. Um, and so when you think about sports being, you know, what we found was great was, you know, you put it right at, at, at the um, center line and in basketball, amazing to watch the basketball game. Uh, really not great to watch behind the basketball game, you know, like, and so, so you keep on going back to, you know, the, the real value was the 180 degrees. So we started moving towards that and it's much easier to do um, in 180 degrees. This is the, 
you know, there's a, a lot of different tools to do this right now. Um, the company that really got ahead of, were ahead of all of us for a long time was NextVR. NextVR figured out I can take two red cameras and put them next to each other, put some um, 180 degree lenses on them and I can, you know, I can shoot 180 degrees. Uh, they, Apple bought them and all their patents. So <laughs> just in case you're wondering why 180 degrees is probably going to be a big deal is because Apple bought the company that was probably the furthest along first. Um, now this has gotten, you know, much easier. You're going to say something, Grant? Yeah, I was just going to add. I, I I remember watching. Um, there was a stream that um that you did, that Pixel Core did, of a of a big concert, and it was in in three sixty. And I remember watching it. And to your exact point, the more that I went right around to the audience was just a useless shot. And at that point, it felt like it was just double the bandwidth for no reason, because right. I was spending all the time at, out the front, and so. Um, the basketball in the basketball um, example, the best spot for three hundred and sixty would be to hang it above the 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 center circle, right? Like, and so, so now you could spin well, yourself. Around. I will say we did then, test with that. The best place right. to put them is right on the court while you're playing, but the basketball players run into them, and you lose a GoPro about <laughs> once every every <laughs> ten minutes. <laughs> but but even then, as a viewer. You, you're constantly spinning yeah. around like that's not how you watch the game um, and so being on the sideline and having a 180 is perfect um, yeah. because you, you and it, even 180 is slightly more than you want anyway right like or that yeah. you need because you might be more like 90 or you know 45 however your your viewing angle is 50 or something and you're moving that a little bit and you just don't need that 360 so I'm I'm very excited about 180. Yeah, and 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 it's gotten much easier. This is the um, uh, it's on it's on the the thing that you want on the email. But this is this is the um, this is the Canon. This is the R five C. Um, and it what it does here is this is a this is two two uh, hundred and eighty degree lenses, um, and they are uh, they are going onto an eight K frame. So what they're doing, how that works, is there's not two chips in there. There is one chip that's there, full frame sensor. And then what happens is, is that each one of those, those lenses is putting those on. So then, then it's just a matter of processing that image. Now you can't process that at full resolution live yet. So this is, so you have to, um, you know, so basically if you want to take that live, you start thinking about things like a, a Red Raptor um, because the Red Raptor will have that full frame sensor. It has a high resolution. It has a way to output it. Um, you can put the same lens on it um, to make that actually happen. Um, so, so those are the things there, but the, there's a couple of things that's interesting here, and this is important is that, uh, is that the, um, if you notice, if I put it under my eyes, look at how close the distance between those two lenses are to my eyes. And that's a really important thing. That's what we call in with your eyes. It's called interocular distance. And with the, the, with the, uh, camera, it's called interaxial distance. And, um, but the interaxial and the interocular matching up is really important because, uh, if, if it, the closer it gets together, the less stereo effect you have. And, and you'll, you'll notice that a little bit if you use the Apple phone, it's doing some computer work to spread it out a little bit. But if you're using the, the 15, it's stereo, but not super stereo, <laughs> you know? And so, um, uh, if you, but so the, having that interocular makes it much more natural looking to the viewer. Um, it looks a little flat if they're closer together and it, it, it'll, it'll start to hurt if you start moving them further apart. Now, sometimes we do move them further apart. So we've moved them as I've, I've seen them moved very far apart. The most I've moved them apart is about three feet. And the reason we did that was because we were in a landscape. And so by opening them up, you can't, as long as you don't have anything really close to you, if you pull that interaxial, it, it, it exaggerates the stereo um, and it makes landscapes that would normally look just very flat because you don't really see a lot of parallax after about 20 feet. And so by opening it way up, you get parallax for a lot further. It's kind of this weird forced perspective thing that you can do with landscape shots that, that are kind of interesting as you move those cameras apart. Um, but that, cam that interaxial distance turns out to be the real challenge. That's why... The, the Canon, um, that's why this this lens is so interesting is because by putting it onto one mount, you're able to make that interaxial work because the problem you get into is how do you get the two cameras together? I had a mount that I couldn't, I found it and then I couldn't find it for the show, but we had mounts built for um, the, 
uh, the micro the the micro studio uh, that Black Magic made that you could just mount them side by side um, into them. We had a machined so that we could do those with 180 degree lenses and and so. Um, so anyway, so those are, you know, that hunt, uh, there's a couple different hundred degree lenses that are available. Um, and you're going to see probably more of them at NAB. That's one of the reasons I wanted to do this before we got to NAB was so that you could think about it, research it and know that there's, I don't know how many, but there's definitely a lot of people talking about this. Um, and the, and the, so you know, there, yeah, go ahead, go ahead, Grant. Alex, can I just ask, so then what about convergence and, yeah, and don't get zoom? It. Right, zooming and focus way. and things like that. So there, so there is no zooming on that camera. No, you don't zoom. Definitely don't zoom. Yeah. So, so where you start to think about um, the typically the one eighty can't really do the convergence the way you would do it. Now, what he's talking about is that we don't actually look. You know, we think if you look at someone above, you think that they're looking straight ahead like this all the time, but that's not actually what's happening. Um, they're actually looking just ever so slightly in like this at whatever they're looking at. So if they're looking at something, your eyes are actually converging on that thing. And you notice that if you, you know, if I take, if I, uh, <laughs> if I take this pen, if you, if, I don't know how well you can see my eyes ever zoom, but if I go like this and I'm looking at it, you can see my eyes go in and out. And it usually is not that dramatic, right? But it is, but it does happen. And that convergence is something that is important. So when you do, when you do a stereo pair, when we're doing especially 16 by nine, so rectilinear, a regular 16 by nine or two, three, five or whatever you want. The, the issue is, is that we often, you know, there are, um, Preston actually made these great little controllers for the Sony camera, the Sony rigs that, that they had that you could control zoom focus and convergence. And typically you could lock convergence and focus together because they're usually very related. If you're, if you're focusing on something five and a half feet away, you're probably converging on the same thing, but you couldn't separate those out, which made your, again, the problem with convergence and the problem with a lot of these things is that it doesn't take very much for you to make someone feel really uncomfortable. And that's one of the reasons it's important for us to talk about is that this is a really powerful format that I think is going to become very popular as the headsets become more popular but we have to understand where the limitations are and it's going to change the way we do filmmaking. You know, so, you know, when we do this and, and if you look at the sphere, the sphere is another, another version of that. The sphere is taking up their, their uh, lens. I think it takes a little bit more than 180 degrees, but it's somewhere in that, you know, 180 degrees range. Um, 18K. <laughs> it's a really, really high resolution sensor. Um, so, uh, and so the, um, uh, so that that really, really high resolution is coming. Now that's only in 2D. The other thing to remember is that when you start to do, um, when you start to do the stereo uh, 180, that there's only so much distance. So if you um, typically, if you're here, there is, and you have a, you know, someone in front of you, there is this range that's particularly good. So in this range, in something closer than three feet, because of the convergence problems, it gets pretty uncomfortable because you're not really converging the way you should. And inside of three feet, it's pretty, pretty difficult. And I would say even three to five feet is kind of this area um, that, that is more problematic. Um, and then what you want is, uh, and then at 10 feet, it's, it's really eight to 10, eight to 12 feet. Um, eight to 12 feet is really the place that you want a lot of things to be. Um, and then after that, after 12 to 20 feet, there's a little bit of value. After 20 feet, it's all flat. Like you just don't see it, especially in the resolution of the cameras that we have right now. You just don't really see a lot of, a lot of, it's not that effective after that. And so we have to understand that we're shooting differently because of that. Um, so like, for instance, if you have, what we've kind of learned is that if you have a, if you have a, 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 a you know, a performer, oftentimes where you want the camera is typically um, about eight to 10 feet away and really at about shoulder or chest level is this kind of, that's kind of where it is. And if you look at some of the stuff that Apple did, you'll find that that, that frame is pretty popular with them. Um, you know, as they, as they start to put this together, you can play with those frames, but that's a really, that's a really useful frame as far as the distance goes of getting that stereo effect. Um, but also having, uh, you know, having a stereo effect. Um, and, and so I think that, uh, but without hurting somebody you know, to, to do that. The hard part is, is that we don't see a lot of concerts or other things that way because there's, that's a really prime place for the lead singer to be looking at the audience. And so it's really hard to get someone to agree to, I'm going to put 360 people in the room and I'd like, or a thousand people in the room and I'd like to put a camera right in front of their main view of the, of the lead singer. And so those are, the, those are the challenges there. Another thing is, is that as soon as you start losing track of the edges, so if you think about 
your field of view, as soon as your as soon as your field of view does not reach the edge of a screen, and this happens on very large screens, and also and, and same thing up and down, you know, up and down. As soon as all you see is the video, your your mind, especially as you start to increase the frame rate, can lose track of where it's at. So your inner ear is telling you. Um, uh, this is where I am, this is where I am, this is where I am. And your visual cortex is then correct, you know, is giving you that information. The inner ear is checking that information. Uh, this is where I think I am. When they don't match, if you have a high performing inner ear and it doesn't match where your eyes are. So people who have, who get seasick, they really, what they should say is you have a high performing inner ear. <laughs> you know, like so, so the, that, that means it's very sensitive to where you are. And that, that's why you tend to get seasick is because, the system that you're on is moving and you don't have a point of reference and your eyes are going, my eye, you know, my inner ear is telling me very quickly. See, like for me, I don't get seasick because I have a very low performing inner ear. So I don't have, you know, I can, I don't get sick at all. I can do, which makes me good for VR because I, I'm, it, it, you know, I have very thick skin to look at those kinds of things. Um, but the issue is, is that the reason that this is important is as you start to think about this, you have to start realizing that that's a problem that you can't keep on moving the camera. This is why I think filmmaking is about to change is because there's a couple things that your your mind, your inner ear doesn't like or is it doesn't like cutting a lot, sometimes at all. And it doesn't like, um, it doesn't like to move the camera. <laughs> so you can think about how many films have you seen in the last, you know, 50 years that doesn't move the camera very much, not many. <laughs> so so it's, it's a pretty unusual way to do it. And we have to realize that a lot of the reasons we were moving our cameras and doing all those things was because we were stuck in this little 16 by nine window or two, three, five window. And so we had to keep on showing you all the other things. And so what, what, what we think is going to happen, or a lot of us think are going to happen is that you're going to start, as we start to design for this format, we're going to start reducing the number of cameras, reducing the number of of clips and having you experience, it's going to be more about experiencing something. And as a result, in the exact same way that filmmaking began, if you look at filmmaking before it became narrative, we just took pictures of cool things. Like, you know, we just took people, there's the train, there's people, there's, there's someone dancing, there is, there's someone playing an instrument. If you look at the earliest video, it's all, you know, experimenters that are capturing the, the world around them without a lot of movement because they couldn't and they, you know, they had this stuff. And so, we're kind of, we get to start again, you know, in this 180 degrees where we don't know how we're going to tell narrative, but it probably isn't going to be the way we did it before. The other thing is, is that one of the things that we have is, you know, you have, uh, you know, uh, 24, let me get a better color here. You have 24 frames a second. And really, in all practical purposes, we have 120 frames a second. And in between you have 30 and you have 60 and you have, 90. Now, the reason that 90 is important is because the the Quest and the Apple Vision right now running about 90, because that's really the minimum of where you really feel like you're engaged. You'll feel like you'll feel the lag otherwise. So 90, somewhere between 90, 96 frames a second is where you, that becomes a problem or that that's where it needs to be. 90 is the minimum viable product to show you something in an interface to do that. Um, and then 120 is a is a is a goal other than 90 120 is a really great frame rate because it e it's evenly divisible by 60 30 and 40 and so that's why i mean you could go to 144 you could go to other things but but 120 happens to be a really nice one and your tvs most of your cameras many other things are now running at 120 <laughs> probably not by accident so um so a lot of things are all running are already already moving into the 120 frame per second uh area and so um, where we think we're going to end up seeing something is is we're going to see frame rates. The next version of most of these headsets we think are going to go towards the 120. Definitely most of us expect the next Apple headset to go to 120 frames a second. Um, the next Pro or whatever that's two years away or whatever. We don't know what the distance is, but we think it'll go to 120 frames a second. And then where we also see the resolution right now, we're at 4K per I. Um, for a lot of things, we think that that will most likely land between 8 and 10K per I. Um, as the processing power goes up. Um, and and that's, I can tell you, having seen not quite that resolution, but that re that frame rate, it's a different thing. Like it's not, it's not like faster film or deeper whatever. HDR, 8K, you know, 120 frames a second. 
it's a different experience. It, it, it is like it's as close to being there as that you can be without being there. And we keep on thinking that it's just, you know, when people say they're not that VR isn't going to really work, I'm like, well, you haven't seen that footage. Like, you know, as soon as you see that footage, you're like, oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, like, like I understand now. And, and again, like the same thing happened like with LED walls. We, we fought LED walls forever because they were, you know, mar- all this moray and everything else. But now you're starting to see the LED walls now that they've gotten to 1.5 and below. And, you know, you're starting to see, you don't see the moray anymore. You don't see, you, we've got better controllers. We've got all the things that we need. And now you're realizing, oh, you can do a lot. You can do a lot of really interesting things with it now that they've gone over the technical hurdles. And I have to admit that the, 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 the challenge is always people would tell you, well, eventually we're going to get there. And people like me are like, yeah, but right now it looks horrible. <laughs> you know? And so you have to kind of keep working through that, that process. You're going to say something. I'll, I'll, anyway, we'll go to you guys. Go uh, ahead, Grant. Yeah, I, I was just going to ask, um, when you started talking about where it goes with narrative, um, I've, I've heard you say before uh, about theatre, like starting off with theatre um, and, and a stage, and that was, that was the experience. And then, and then we moved to, you know, kind of this, uh, to cinema or to, to film. And like you were saying, the camera didn't move very much. It was like, and now you see the train move and whatever it is, but it was taking it all out of the theatre and now into the world. Where do you think, uh, like, I feel like in some ways we're coming back to the theatre in this way mm-hmm. with, a, with a 180 in one way that we're getting the optimal position and would be amazing for musicals and, and plays and things, right, to, to have that in 180 and just sit there in the, in the, in the optimal position um, and to be able to watch a play without, without cameras switching around and things like that. But then what's the next, what's the, what's, what harnesses this new technology in a way that isn't just transporting you to a theater, but is actually, you know, taking it to a new level? My first answer will be, I don't know. Uh, We haven't been able to spend real money on a big production that's in 180 degree stereo yet. Um, You know, the most we've spent on this kind of thing is a couple hundred thousand dollars, which is not, I mean, it's a lot of money, but it's not like, feature film money, <laughs> you know, like, so, so, you know, we don't know exactly, you know, where a lot of those things go. Um, I do think that we're going to see it mostly in experiences at first. So sports um, lend themselves towards this, concerts lend themselves towards this. And, you know, a lot of times, you know, I do a lot, of, I work on a lot of concerts. And so you get into a, this discussion about the artists really needing the audience to be there before they to get their best performance. And I can tell you as someone who's done this for a long time now with a lot of different, in a lot of different formats, the art, most artists, the best ones, especially really don't <laughs> like, like they don't need the audience to, to do that. They can, um, now there's some call and return and some other stuff that they can't do when they don't have an audience there to do that. There may be ways to sort that out. Um, the, but the, um, if you think about actors, actors, you know, stage actors love being in front of people and getting that reaction and everything else. But a film actor is emoting an enormous amount, you know, uh, you know, they're in a moment and they're being somebody else with 40 people around them that aren't even really paying attention to them. And they're able to get that experience at the same time. So when we think about uh, the limitations of it, we don't want to think about the audience necess- you know, necessarily, you know, in that, in that environment. Um, so I think that there's going to be some opportunities to either put them in front of the audience or just get rid of the audience altogether so that they can have these. I think these are great, for instance, uh, you know, we're talking to a couple different uh, recording studios because we think recording studios are exceptional places to do, do um, 180 degree because a recording studio um, has a lot of geometry that's near you, that's within 20 feet of you. So a big concert stage spreads everything out, you know, but a recording studio pulls everything in. And so I've got drum sets and guitar players and and then you have all the things in the roof that are all com- hanging down and and so we think 180 degrees in a recording studio is super interesting um, because the geometry will feel very 3D. And you saw a little bit of that. If you have an Apple Vision Pro, you, you might have uh, at least, I was going to try to show you these. Turns out the uh, the the content control uh, will not go through the mirror. <laughs> so, so you can't mirror the uh, mirror anything on the, all the, everything goes black, even Apple stuff, which is dumb. Anyway, so the, um, uh, so uh, but Alicia Keys, they have this thing where they kind of go around. Now, I will tell you that I prefer not to cut at all. Like the Alicia Keys example that a lot of people use, um, I felt 
lost something by cutting around and having her walk around. I felt like they worked too hard at that. And I can see why you would do it because you wouldn't want to take the chance with a single camera. But the, really, the single camera is a really interesting experience. It also means that the artist can have a, a close relationship with the audience. There's only one place for the artist to look when they want to look at the audience. You know, we do some of these events and we'll say, you know, we have a single camera and we'll say, when you look at that camera, you're looking at 30,000 people like in the eyes, you know, and you don't get to do that any other place in the world. <laughs> like even when you're playing in a, in a bar, you're only looking at one person at a time. In this case, you can look at everybody at the same time, you know, and so, so having the 180, 180 degree camera, we think is going to be a really interesting um, puzzle there. Again, I think that um, as we increase the frame rate, as we add more immersive sound, as we, you know, those kinds of things, I think we're going to end up with people feeling more connected. Yeah, go ahead, Guy. Yeah, it's not just the frame rate, it's the quality of the pixels as well. Some of the people that originally shot on these cameras as the Quest was starting to come out and the Oculus Rift way back in 2016, uh, they didn't shoot with what we have access to now, which is that camera in your hand for 5500 bucks with the lens. And uh, if you go on and uh, watch uh, Hugh Howe's videos, he's just a master at shooting some of this, these, uh, these newer videos with um, that camera and putting it inside of the Quest uh, 3, which I have, there's a high quality download uh, area. And that's the ticket is in the future, people are going to have Wi-Fi 7 gigabit plus connections. And the speed at which this stuff comes down and the quality is just going to blow your mind because it's it's there in that higher quality signal that you get the, the banding of the sky goes away, the frame rate goes up. And then also, if you happen to get a Quest, uh, um, the Canon has a uh, VR basics tutorial has this where, you know, I'm doing this with steering in, in YouTube, but they talk about this filmmaking, the, the basics of stereoscopic filmmaking where people are going to be looking up and looking down. So in that example of, of the bride coming down the stairs, where does your head go to? And so you're just shooting things different because now the viewer can look up instead of being stuck here at this frame, you can look up and, and there's the reveal. Oh, she's up there. So Watch some of these if you get a chance. I'll put a link in the chat to the basics of uh, filming stereoscopic 3D from Canon. They have a whole series uh, and of the whys of not to do 360 of why they, they're embracing 180 instead. And they have a whole line of cameras. In fact, at uh, CES, they had a bunch of beta cameras on the floor to show. So they're really embracing uh, stereoscopic 3D and 180. Good, Bill. I'm just curious as whether the fact that we've had generations now of kids gaming constantly for long periods of time will change the tolerance for some of these motions that were not maybe natural in the old days. But now you've had kids that have spent tens of thousands of hours looking around environments in the gaming world. And will that condition them to being more accepting of a 180 movable camera frame? Yeah, I mean, I think that there is a... Uh um, there is some of that, but some of it's lower brain, you know, like, so okay. I was talking to someone at, I was talking to someone at a big entertainment company and they were, this is 20 years ago or 20, maybe 25 years ago. I was sitting around talking to them at, at, at Seagraph and they had this simulator that they had in Orlando, Florida. And, um, they had a simulator where they were trying to build some VR stuff and they had these huge SGI Onyx boxes and they were doing all the calculations. And I mean, there's like three or four of them doing the calculations for the scene and they would pay college students to come in and um, they would say, move your head to the left, move your head to the right, look up, look around. And what they were doing while that college student was doing that, that college student didn't notice when they walked in that it smelled like um, like Windex and uh, it was all plastic around them. <laughs> it was, it was, when will they throw up? <laughs> like, like, like literally that was, that was the, that was the only thing they were trying to figure out. What frame rate will it be? And, um, and they said that, you know, on average, they found that they really needed, they really needed to be at least at 18 frames a second, um, you know, or people, you know, that was minimum. And really, you know, as it got up higher frame rate, it got better. But for them, this is back, you know, 25 years ago, 18 frames a second with anything of value of anything of detail was really hard. So they wanted to know how low can they go. And they said people start, some people get queasy pretty quickly, almost no matter, no matter what, some people got queasy at 18. A lot of people could go down to 15 or 16. But the point that I'm, want to make is what they said, what they told me, I wasn't doing the research, is that even a pilot, you know, like a fighter pilot can't handle less than 12. You know, like they were just like, when you go down to that number, they're going to at least feel sick. 
and 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 that's someone who is highly engaged in moving moving things around them that that you're fighting a million years of of uh, evolution so i think that the reason i say that is because i think that there is some stuff that you're absolutely correct you're going to people people used to something are going to get used to it like i don't really like watching gameplay because i don't like the shaky camera the weird thing where you're seeing every you know the mouse moving and everything else there are some people that don't even notice it now, you know, so you're absolutely right. But I think when you get into taking over your your entire field of vision, there are some lower brain considerations that you have to take into account. Also, you have to remember that the mass market is still going to be um, the average person buying an Apple Vision Pro right now, as an example, is much older than the average game player. <laughs> so, so, so that, you know, just because of the how much it costs. So, so I think that, you know, the, the um, and you talk to a lot of folks that sell headsets, and they'll tell you they're trying to build content for 18 to 24 year olds because that's the solid place that they want it. But the people who are buying the headsets are 35 to 55, you know, and that's the, that they're kind of trying to keep pulling it down, but it's it's harder for them to, to get there. So it'll be interesting. Let's go ahead and jump into the questions. Alex Forty Golner, our friend in Zone 2, Northwest London, has the first one. And his question is this. I don't see how dual fisheye lenses gives you proper stereo video in any direction except straight ahead. When the eye position in each lens are eye distance apart, looking left or right, eye position is one behind the other. How can this be good? It, it's better. It's not great. <laughs> so, so there is a so you're 100 percent right that 180 degrees is you know and there's always a uh compromise between what you can actually shoot effectively so um if you uh move those cameras apart if you start stitching them together you can get something that feels more natural in a lot of ways um, because you do have problems like there is a when you process this there is an occlusion because technically these lenses at the edges are seeing each other. So you have to map that out or, or something else because on the inside of them, they see, they see the other lens, you know? And so, um, so you do have a little bit of uh, shading that has to be kind of taken into account there. A lot of times people just mat it out. Um, but the, uh, so there is that limitation that's there. Um, again, we're going to be constantly, I have problems with almost every stereo, even things shot in stereo. The motion blur doesn't really work for me yet. You know, there's a lot of things that are that are still problematic. So it's more of a um, this is where we are right now. So um, but I think that it is still pretty compelling when you when you get to see it that way. Next question. Gabriela Asesio Mistira back in Sault Ste. Marie is up again. Isn't 180 degree video just half of 360 video? In the paraphrased words of the philosopher Ron Swanson, why go halfway when you can go all the way? The technology already exists. And I think we addressed this a little bit yeah. is that that the it, the amount of extra work that it takes to support 360, the, the ROI is just not there. And a lot of times you have uh, privacy concerns, you have quality concerns, the amount of work to stitch everything together and the amount of processing required to stitch everything together is way higher with 360. And the question is, is do, are we really getting anything out of it? Because a lot of people aren't looking there. So the reason again, that I, I, I wanted to show that I started in 360 to get to 180 because it's not that we don't know how to do the 360. It's that we've learned that we just don't need it very often. There are opportunities that to, to want 360 and to explore. Um, but I think that like, for instance, I, you know, one of the tests that I did with the Ozo that I didn't ever really, um, completely finish. Um, but we, we did some, we did some tests, um, to kind of think about this as we went, I went, I would happen to be driving from Philadelphia to Pittsburgh Halfway between is Gettysburg. And so I stopped at Gettysburg and I went to Pickett's chart where Pickett's charge began. And I set a, an Ozo down and I um, got a lot of looks, <laughs> but it was in the evening and I shot a 360 uh, with the Ozo to to capture that. And the reason I did that and we, we started playing with the, the the content was the idea that you could put on a headset, look out and see, you know, we you see the the current view fade into, you know, what it was like in 18, you know, uh, 1863. And you start seeing, you know, poof, poof, and then and then you could hear all of the, the the cannons going by. You could hear the marching behind you. Turn around, see the the soldiers, mar you know, fifteen thousand soldiers marching to battlefield, um, and and hearing all those things and being part of it all. I think that's a three sixty experience, to be honest. Like I just think that that's what you want to build around um, that. But I think that most of the time, especially from a live perspective or an event perspective, you don't want to have the back end. Yeah, good guy. Behind the scenes, you're going to see a lot of, uh, you know, flags and things, 
stands and support that you just uh, don't really want to see. So they talk about this in this introduction to stereoscopic 3D of all the different things that pieces of the puzzle that you need. And the other thing is just that bit budget. When you think about how much all these 8K files weigh, you only have so much to play with. And so if you can half that with just 180, you're all of a sudden able to allocate more of that bid budget towards a higher quality what's for what's predominantly in front of you rather than spending it on what's behind you that nobody really wants to look at anyway, which may be some of these C-stands and things that, uh, what are we going to do, have to move it all out or have to raise everything in a, into rigging in the sky, which gets really expensive and really, you know, could be dangerous if people don't know what they're doing of rigging stuff up high. And a lot of times the way we've managed it is is we don't, actually send you all the video at full resolution. So we you, we basically send what's in front of you there. And the hard part is if you turn your head really fast, you'll see things that are a little soft that suddenly get sharp because what we're doing is we're predictively um, only sending you the front half when we're doing 360. We're only sending you what you're looking at. So it's kind of a level of detail of the video. So you're getting a lower resolution video and it's, it ramps up really quickly as you start to turn towards it. But again, in a lot of times it's easier just to do 180. <laughs> Next question. Rob Collins in Kansas City, Missouri. Up next, regarding motion sickness, has putting a decorative plate a bit under the camera to give the viewer a ground plane to refer to, does that help at all? It does. You really need to be around the whole thing, though. The, the, the issue is, is that that's what the movie screen is good at. If you sit back where you can see just a little bit of the edge of the movie screen, it tends to um, frame you up, and the 180 is designed to take that away. So even if you put something in the frame itself, um, it's the problem is, is that it's still moving with everything else that you're seeing there. So it provides a little, the, because the issue is that that thing down below is still in the video frame. Um, and so it, unless you're making it just a piece of graphic that's there, which then feels like it's floating over top of those things. And so it's a, it's a complicated process. There's, there's a little bit of, you know, we see a lot of experimentation right now with the vision pro. Like I put on this really cool, um, cellular visualization of cells, but they put it inside of a window. And I was kind of like, I don't understand why you did that. <laughs> like, like, why would you not just give me a cell that's sitting and floating in, in space in front of me? So there's a lot of things that we're still experimenting with there. Next question. Roscoe Jones in Madison, Indiana. Up next, do you choose to walk and or dolly towards objects that need to be seen in more detail? Would a jump cut to be in closer, uh, in a closer shot be disturbing? So my experience so far is that jump cuts uh, are actually less disturbing than dolly shots and walking in. The walking in, you'll suddenly, you'll slow, the dolly shot, you'll slowly feel your stomach pulling in as that dolly, and the faster it goes. Now you can go pretty slow and it'll actually work. It's not like you can't do it. If you look at stereo stuff, people do it all the time and you will feel it at times. You don't, the interesting thing is you don't feel it at lower frame rates that much. So at 30 frames a second, 24 frames a second, at 60, you start feeling a touch of it. At 120, you feel it all the time, like if someone moves the camera. So, and we have to note that we are probably looking at 100, you know, within two years, being at 120 frames a second, 8K per eye, 180 degrees. That's the most likely the level level off of what what is going to be, there's going to be some headsets out there that do that, uh, most likely in the next two to three years. Uh, next question. Next one comes to us from Douglas Carmichael. How would you shoot 180 video from a moving vehicle like a snowmobile or 4x4? Um, I'd probably uh, stabilize it, um, and, and it will make mo many, maybe not all, but many people sick. <laughs> so you wouldn't do that. <laughs> so, uh, you know, typically you, would, you, know, you could do it and it would give people an experience, but a lot of people would complain about it. Um, next question. Brody Hefner in New York City. Hugh Ho's YouTube channel offers a wealth of 180 and 360 video hardware and software reviews, trainings, and hands-on production guidance. Any other good resources you can recommend? Good guy. Yeah, Hugh Howe definitely has been the most giving person in this arena. He's he's not only got the the how tos on how to shoot it, but also how to edit it using DaVinci. So he's he goes in and shows even how to put titles and make them so that they look clean and that they're in the right space. Um, Canon has a series. I put a link in the chat to. There's about five or so, but again, they're the only company that I've seen that it, uh, on the. On the uh, you know, Nikon, Panasonic, Sony level of camera manufacturers that has embraced uh, 180 stereoscopic. And you know, I don't see anybody else that has a lens like that, that's, uh, you know, dual fisheye all in one. And they're even marketing it as an all in one package for, for, uh, I don't know. Did you buy yours as the kit, Alex? I, I think you? it's, I think that kit, the kit costs about 5,500 bucks if I remember correctly. So yeah. And, and the, the, um, uh, the, 
other advantage of shooting onto one sensor is sync, right? So that's the other reason that when you have two cameras, there's a whole level of, of complexity that gets added is that you have to sync those frames up together. But again, I think that there's also Insta360 has their own solutions. Um, there are, uh, you know, there's uh, um, Cano uh, makes their, you know, makes a lot of their own stuff. So you're going to see a lot more of those cameras. This is kind of like the re everyone gets to do this again like every 20 or 30 years we get to do the we get to you know or anywhere 10 to 20 years we get to try 3d again and but i think that the headsets are the ultimate 3d viewer so i think that you know as this grows um and i think that most people you know some people think that this is a short term solution but most people who understand what apple's you know how apple approaches things understands that this is most likely a um uh this is a we're 10 years into a 20 year plan like they're they're definitely going to keep on going down that path um next question next one comes from kyle hammond in chicago illinois i'm still curious if the x real glasses offer a knockoff version of what we're discussing or is it just a static wider static view are there levels to this concept good guy yeah, the X reels are just going to be a static view. They might have something they're coming up with, but the the MetaQuest I think is the cheapest entry level product to get into this. And I mean, Costco has a great return policy. That's what I did. Is I was happy to be buying some food and just said, you know what? Uh, do you have any of those uh, MetaQuests in stock? And they said yeah. So they walked up and brought me one. I said ninety day return policy, and I'm going to keep it. It's just it's amazing. I mean, if you want to see what's going on in the future, there's twenty million of these headsets out there. So people have embraced this, and it's only going to become more and more fluid especially as more people shoot great content. Some of the stuff that I've, I like the traveling ones. So you can go to like uh, Zion National Park and you can just, you know, look around and the level of detail is pretty stunning. Having been to the sphere, now I see what the next level is with that 16K video. It's it's astonishing because I'm a pixel peeper and while in the sphere, I'm like looking for, you know, things that are breaking apart. And they had like the Sistine Chapel and you're looking at all this detail and glass and, and ornate fixtures and it's all there. It's not smudged. Yeah. It's not gone. It's there. And so that's where we're going. We're going to get that level of detail with these newer cameras and systems. So be, being able to get into it for 499 bucks and travel the world. Well, some of these apps are costing me like 20 bucks or $10, but they're worth it. I mean, it's like getting to travel and not having to leave your house and it is fully immersive. I mean, you look around uh, it, behind you, even on some of these, it's, it's the, there's video behind you. So it's, it's not just 180, some of it's 360. Yeah, and the X-Reels aren't going to have head tracking and, you know, a lot of the other things that are there. Um, I use a little MetaQuest 2. I don't have the 3 or the Pro yet. I'm looking to get in a Pro or someone's going to lend me a Pro <laughs> to, to use. Um, but uh, but the um, but I will say even with the 2, uh, it's it's pretty impressive. It's $250 right now. Like it's, it's relatively inexpensive to get into less than the X-Reel, to be honest. And so and I think so. So I think that and I have an X-Reel as well. Um, it has a funky cable, which is, I lost, I misplaced the cable and now I don't use it at, at all because I can't find, it doesn't just take any USB-C cable. It, it and, does. Try no. try a couple of different ones because after you said right. that last time, I tried a couple of mine and they all worked. Oh, USB, it to it's got to be so a USB just, 3 data, high speed data yeah. cable. Okay, I'll take a look. I'll try, I have a lot of those and I plugged it in. I couldn't get it to work and then I was like, okay, well, I set it down and I haven't used it since. So I, I just couldn't get a cable to work with it. So um, uh, next question. Rob Collins in Kansas City, Missouri comes up next and he says, would having the camera blink quickly flayed, fade to black and come back help with cutting between scenes or locations without disturbing the viewer? Yeah, so we've used that in 360 and 180 since we started. So we're going to take you to another scene. We'll go to black. Now, again, you can cut between it. It's just that you have to be very careful of not doing it too often. If you start doing a lot of fast edits, people get ill. If you do a, an edit, you just have to slow the edits down. It doesn't mean you can't use any editing. You just have to slow it down or people start to feel uncomfortable. And there are some examples. Red Bull has a spatial video on the Apple that they put on their app in the Apple store, which might be available on Meta as well, where they're, I mean, helicopters doing cr the most insane things that you can imagine. I mean, I, they had a helicopter that was setting its nose on the, it was pushing its nose into the side of the, of the um, hill and people are getting on it. The back end is still in the air. <laughs> like, like it's still holding it up. Like it's just, there's no sign on there. But they did that all in spatial. And um, and so they they broke most of the rules we just talked about. And you can and I think that when you know that those things exist, you'll notice, oh, right, that didn't maybe work as well as it could. Next question. 
Juan C. Robles, our friend in uh, Mexico City, Mexico, says, is there any plan to shoot some 180 video during the eclipse? Uh, no. And the reason for it is that the, the eclipse is you really need to zoom in on the on the, what's happening there to get the most out of it. And then, you know, the, and the 180 really you just see very, very wide. Um, so you would it would look like a little tiny dot. Maybe you'd see something in the area, but we don't not working on that right now. Uh, it just because we we did shoot some 180. I shot some 360. I might even have 360 photos. I'll have to look. I, I might even have them here of the uh, 20, 2017 eclipse um, in Bend, Oregon, and it just looked like this little dot. It looks like it, it looks it looks like a sensor error um, on the in a 360. Yeah, go ahead, Bill. I just wonder if you had a wide shot of a valley or something like that, would you see the edge of the eclipse? move across the valley is there enough resolution in the edge how how fuzzy or distinct is the edge of the eclipse that's just curious you can see it. it's just really it's just really um uh it's really far away <laughs> okay. so that's, i mean i mean that's the that's the that's the hard part is, is that it's i'm just trying to i'm seeing if i can find it really quick um i i i think i might have That'd be interesting to watch the shadow of the eclipse proceed across a wide landscape. But um, I don't know if it was actually something that would be seeable or whether I that edge, it. it's so far away. Yeah, I thought I shot some 360s while we were there, but I just don't know if they'll show up quickly. Oh, here. Yeah. yeah. Hold on. Let's see here. Yeah, that's why I love this show. You yeah, ask a question is, like that, and somebody can show you exactly what it looks like. Yeah, yeah exactly. So, so this <laughs> how is how many this chances? Is, this is the this is what it looked like. So I, I had this one running on a time lapse. So um, you can see all of our cameras there. We're doing the interviews. There it gets dark, but you never it never really got dark to the 360 camera. So it it was, um, and this is 360, but you can see it got dark and then it got bright again. <laughs> so this was this was inside the, you know, this was in, we this was the the little. Uh, interesting hut that was there that we used for it. Uh, next question. Next question comes from Rian Smith and Trinidad West Indies. What's the cost of a Canon 180 setup you have, uh, Alex, or something comparable that is as good? Good guy. Yeah, it looks like it's on sale now for uh, five thousand ninety nine. So there's a, a discount from the fifty seven ninety nine seven hundred dollar instant savings on the on the Canon website and on big retailers like B and H. Uh, I was looking at getting the the Apple uh, Vision Pros or. <laughs> it's like, do you want to be a consumer or do you want to be a creator? And so, you know, for a little bit more, you can actually buy. But it, it, it turns out that it's not just buying the camera, it's the media. So you, you're, you're going to want to record in RAW, so you're going to need the cards. And then for a tripod, you actually need a head where you can put the camera out. So you need like a, um, it's not just the tripod, you need to push the camera out so that you don't see the, the legs. So you need another arm to go out. That's a couple hundred bucks. So by the time you pack everything in there and then you go travel to these exotic destinations to shoot stuff, it's like, all right, uh, I might just go get a new Apple uh Mac Ultra instead with the money. <laughs> yeah, and there's you know there's the the com a, a company that's doing a lot of like 360 and so on and so forth is uh, Candao Candao, um, which is uh, this is whoops this is the wrong. We screen. stopped by their booth at uh, CES. They had a 12K camera uh, that was pretty pretty insane. So they're one of the leaders as well in in this space. Yeah, I'm trying to get out of my full screen here. It's going to be great to track that at NAB and just see, yeah, you know, and what, what 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 new things are there, and you know what rigging there is for people thinking about this and all of that. Yeah, so here you can see this is a 360 version of it, and they've got a lot of different ones. I mean, these are the, the these are oh, these are little one these are um, 8K 30 frames per second 360 solution running a lot like the um, the Thetas, um, the but here's some these little ones that are a little bit more fun. This is a, this is just the Q cam. This is the, the ego here has got two, <laughs> two little, um, um, inter right, the right distance for taking some, uh, dual 4k 60 frame per second. So these are, you know, there are some other options out there, um, that you can start to play with a little bit. Um, and again, it's, it's mostly to, um, this will become more important. Like for instance, something that, I did, we did a long time ago, Nick Justishin, who's on the show oftentimes, uh, 
um, and I and a couple of friends uh, went and shot a wedding in 360. So we shot it with a couple Ozos and then we had a bunch of Thetas. And what we did is Nick had a, he's got one of those domes, 16 foot dome, you know, that you can do with a, with a 180 projector. And we thought no one's going to be that interested, but we'll put it out here just for fun, just to show it off. And um, it was a line for 45 minutes the whole the whole time, the whole night. People were getting drinks, and I think they even moved one of the bars over there, you know, like one of those little mobile bars, because there were so many people sitting around. And um, the uh, but they were all sitting there um, and waiting to go in and see this 360 thing. And now it's going to be something you can put out with a headset, so um, to a headset. So I think that, and I got to say that the 360 stuff, we, you know, I'm I'm thinking about, you know, if I if I ever had any time, I would definitely go back into experimenting with 360 weddings because it's, you know, there's, a, it's not that hard to do pretty well. It's just so compelling right now. And again, the time you get a lot of, the time you get a lot of room to experiment is right at the very beginning when no one knows how to do it. So if I was going to do a 360 weddings, I would start in the next three, three to six months and start shooting them because, you know, don't charge as much, but everyone will be happy with whatever you produce because it's that you're, you're the first 360 and then you'll you'll get into a zone like we found that taking pictures of the bride and groom around the table um was really was really fun you know because you see everybody there yeah good guy yeah here's that 12k uh when that we visited the booth at ces it's talk about go do a wedding with something that nobody else has two thousand uh, twenty six thousand six hundred ninety nine bucks for the four terabyte ssd and you walk it up to the 16 terabyte ssd and you're at 34 nine 34, 35 grand essentially. And yeah, it's kind of bringing back the Ozo, you know, price point and, and look. Which, but a ahead. lot more than the Ozo, yeah. The, 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 the fun, and you'll notice that those cameras are typically, they're leaning up just a little bit. So they're, they go all the way around and they lean up a little bit because we tend not to look at the ground very much. You know, like that's why you, I, a lot of times they're not pointed straight out. They're pointed up a little bit because there's not a lot in the ground that they, that you need right under the, you know, normally all you see is the tripod which you didn't have to paint out. Um, yeah, go ahead, Grant. The, the wedding use case is a really interesting one uh, because when we were talking before about not wanting to see the audience or not wanting to see a lot of the audience, yeah. um, a wedding is a different use case because it's not an audience, they're guests. They're a part of, they're a yeah. part of the event. And so the bride and groom, you know, or the, or the, um, the wedding party, being able to go back and look yeah. at... At, at everyone, you know, and to sort of experience that sitting right there um, as well as what you were saying it, at the reception, capturing there was a bunch those of stuff tables was, and things. There was a bunch yeah. of stuff that was really compelling. Like some of the stuff we showed in it was from the rehearsal night. And also we showed stuff where uh, when everyone was appropriate, we were showing the bride getting the final touches in her room, the, the groomsmen hanging out the um you know and and giving gifts out and and we showed stuff from the recite re, re, you know the um the rehearsal party and all of those things i mean again the person that was that had us do it was an, a vc that really focuses on this and she was like you know if you ever get want to get into that business let me know <laughs> you know like it's a really good it's a really you know i i just couldn't at the time we were doing so much big production i couldn't understand how i would be able to ever do anything at wedding costs you know i just couldn't figure out how to fit into that little box um, uh, and, next question. And talk talk okay. about quality for a second. The the level of detail on some of Hugh Howe's stuff, I could see a singer, and, and you could feel like you're reaching out to them. But I could see the uh, made in China cable um, yeah. detail. Yeah, yeah. That's the level of detail that you could see with it's these possible. kind of systems. And, it's and and the challenge, the biggest challenge we get into is not that the hardware isn't able to do it. It's actually that the um, that it's just hard to get people to let you put the cameras where you need them. You know, so when you can get the camera where you need it, it's a pretty compelling experience. Yeah, good, Grant. Oh, uh, uh, next, next question. Next, I'm sorry, next, next question. Next question, yeah. Roscoe Jones, Madison, Indiana. Might we see feature-length films with very few cuts? Will Alfred Hitchcock's Rope be remade? And he's uh, got a link to it. Go ahead, Grant. Yeah, so as we were talking before about theater, I think um, there's a there's a real opportunity there. But for, for a film... The idea of like a mystery or something where there's a point of view in a room and the camera never moves and it's just the, the, the actors that move in and around and you've got a constant point of view and you, you're able to look around a little bit and the, the idea of a mystery where you're seeing things that, that the actors don't and things like that, that's really an interesting idea. Yeah, absolutely. Good, Bill. 
Rope, maybe. Vertigo? I'm not sure. Can you imagine those push dolly <laughs> zooms in 3D and yeah. a headset? Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think that I think that at first we're going to see, lot, like we saw with early photography, like we saw with early videos, lots of short experiences that will slowly grow into larger experiences. But I think that's what, you know, I think that the Apple's doing a pretty good job of these five-minute, eight-minute, ten-minute experiences, and I think that you're going to see more of that for a while, up to 20 minutes. And feature length will probably take a little while longer. Next question. Robin Cutshaw in Atlanta, Georgia. Does Apple Vision Pro camera have sufficient quality to take useful video for 180? It depends on how you define useful. Um, I think that the the Vision Pro camera, we'll, we'll post some stuff for people to play with, but I because I, I have one here. Um, I haven't done that much with it. I've done a lot with the phone, um, mostly because I've been shooting, I shoot stuff like little concerts, but the idea of shooting with the, the headset on in public mm, little, little, I'm going to take it to uh, GDC on Wednesday and I will shoot some stuff with the Vision Pro to compare it to the phone when I'm there because I want to play with the idea of 180 capture at a conference. Um, next question. Uh, next question comes from Dave Troutman at Edmonton, Canada. Would it be easy to make a ViewMaster app for Vision Pro, the early stereoscopic system? The funny thing about, the, about that question is that is what I would like more than any other app that's out there. And I feel like something is stopping it from happening. ViewMaster had their own on a couple different products, but they've been really careful about the brand and they won't let other people post it. But something that you could take pictures and send them to other people of Viewmaster would probably be the most used stereo app out there. And I'm just mystified that we've gone this far into VR um, and, and, and cameras without having a, a, a really good view. Viewmaster had, had an app, as I said. The problem was is that it was always, it was all limited to um, their own pictures. I'm like, we now have a camera that can take the picture. <laughs> like, you know, go, go ahead, Bill. You must make a tactile controller, though, that has a very long throw button on the side that you bring down and it snaps into position for the next one because yeah. you need the whole ViewMaster experience. That's I mean, required. I, I would even be able to get a pinch and just go like this. I, I'd be oh, okay no, no, that. no, no. It's yeah, got to have the spring. Yeah, the, <laughs> the, um, uh, you know, now I, I have thought about it as a, as a, in short, is if you just took a still, if you put a camera on, of course, on a, tripod you could get something that's very close to a viewmaster of just an experience but i really do want something where i'm going to go to an event and i can just go like this or or whatever and be able to just jump through images and see stereo images i'm just blown away that that doesn't exist um next question rian smith has our last one from trinidad in the west indies 180 or 360 degree wedding alex would you go um i I probably right now would do 180. Um, the 360 is super hard. There is some reason to do 360 where, again, we did it. It's just a lot harder to process. So you just have to know that um, now we use little thetas and they worked great. And there were some great experiences in them as well. So um, with some of the higher res ones for a less expensive wedding. Um, so if you're going to get paid 2000 to $5,000 a unit, I probably do um, smaller cameras and so on and so forth. If you're going to pay me 20 grand a, a wedding, which does get happen. Um, then we'd start using bigger 360 cameras to the, those can those can dao, daos um, would be would be something we'd think about. Well, there you go. Uh, I, an, yet another uh, uh, Tuesday that I thought was going to last for about five minutes, and we are now running a little over. So thanks thanks for all the great questions to our uh, um, our illustrious producers uh, throwing those questions in uh, more than we even needed, and uh, really really great questions. So thank you so much. We can't do this without you. It's a really short show without the questions because we're all questions. <laughs> so anyway, so um, so thanks so much for throwing those in there. Uh, thanks to the panelists. Uh, we can't do this without you either. Uh, it, it was a compact uh, panel, but very effective panel. So uh, so that so it worked out. It worked out perfectly. Um, so thank you so much. And uh, thanks to the incredible team on the back end that does the development, does the cutting, is doing the show today, um, putting all those things together. We, again, can't do this without this little village of somewhere between, there's like 10 to 30 people every morning that get up to make this happen. And we can't do it without any of them, you know, with, without, you know, they, they all have to be there. So it's really, really important to uh, have you all here. And we really appreciate your contribution. Today, if we had had to walk around and do these, answer these questions, we would have uh, gone 68,000 miles. Uh, that is 110,000 kilometers in the Tlaloc Traversal. And that is 542 million bananas for scale. All right, let's go ahead and jump into after hours. Yeah, so mostly 180 and camera production. I could 
bought so many small rig things the other day, last night. They all showed up at 4.30 this morning. <laughs> I was walking downstairs. Oh, you're going to be in uh, I saw this poor uh, guy Hex Ranch like, land for a while. <laughs> I saw the I saw the guy come driving up at like a little before four thirty this morning, and I was like, oh, I, I kind of I was going to should I go grab the equipment from him? And I was like, I got bad head still. I'm still going to get. You could have did out. an unboxing video yeah. in front of us live. <laughs> exactly. No, I, I was I I'm, I'm, I ripped through things so fast. I don't think it'd be any fun to watch. I'm just like I got all my razor blades like, and it's all out. And all right. every small rig thing comes with two. Hex wrenches. Oh, now. yeah, no. <laughs> have with a huge a 500, small rig. Yeah. I actually have the small rig hex wrench collection. Collection. I have the little you. pocket thing. I have, you know, and it's part of why I stick, I have to admit, you get used to small rig and, you know, 